Some people seem born to achieve whatever they want. Call it what you will, getting lucky, being blessed, having the Midas touch. Why are such people so successful? Is it family background, wealth, greater opportunities, high morals, or an easy childhood? New York Times best-selling author John C. Maxwell has the answer. The difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. John Maxwell says that if you are like him, you were never prepared to deal with failure. Coming out of school, he feared it, misunderstood it, and ran away from it. But he's learned to make failure his friend, and he can teach you to do the same. Failing Forward is the course on overcoming failure that was never offered in school. With his trademark warmth and humor, Maxwell teaches straightforward principles for overcoming failure and gives 15 solid steps to help you become the kind of achiever you've always wanted to be. Now here is John C. Maxwell, America's expert on leadership with Failing Forward, turning mistakes into stepping stones for success. Chapter 1. What's the main difference between people who achieve and those who are average? What makes achievers excel? Why do some people skyrocket while others plummet? You can call it luck, blessing, or the Midas touch. But the truth is that some people just seem to achieve incredible things in spite of great difficulties. It doesn't matter what kind of work they do, wherever they are, they just seem to make things happen. Certainly, all people like to think of themselves as above average, but achievers seem to leave average in the dust. But what makes the difference? Why do some people achieve so much? Is it family background? Having a good family growing up is not necessarily a good indicator of achievement. High percentages of successful people come from broken homes. Is it wealth? No. Some of the greatest achievers come from households of average to below average means. Is it opportunity? Two people with similar gifts, talents, and resources can look at a situation and one person will see a tremendous opportunity while the others see nothing. Opportunity is in the eye of the beholder. Is it high morals? I wish that were the key, but it's not. I've known people with high integrity who achieve little, and I've known scoundrels who are high producers. Is it the absence of hardship? For every achiever who has avoided tragedy, there's a Helen Keller who overcame extreme disabilities or a Victor Frankl who survived absolute horrors. So that's not it either. None of those is the key. When it comes right down to it, I know of only one factor that separates those who consistently shine from those who don't. The difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. Throughout our time together, I want you to continually think of what I have just shared with you. In fact, I want to repeat it again, because it's the most important statement in the entire book. The difference between average people and achieving people is their perception of and response to failure. Nothing else has the same kind of impact on people's ability to accomplish their desires. How people see failure and deal with it impacts every aspect of their lives. Yet that ability seems difficult to acquire. Most people don't know where to start looking to get it. I haven't always been good at failing forward. It's certainly not something they tried to teach me in school. Take a look at some of my previous attitudes toward failure and see if your experience was similar. First, I feared failure. On the first day of class, when I was a college freshman, one professor walked in and boldly declared, Half of you in this room will not pass this class. What was my first response? Fear. Up to that time, I'd never failed a class, and I certainly did not want to start. So the first question I asked myself was, What does the professor want? School became a game that I wanted to win. Second, I misunderstood failure. As a child, I thought failure was a percentage. 69 and lower was failure, 70 and above was success. But failure isn't a percentage or a test. It's not a single event. It is a process. 
Third, I was unprepared for failure. When I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree, I wasn't at all prepared for what was ahead of me. I found that out in my first job. As the pastor in a small rural church, I did everything the people might expect of me and then some. But to be honest, I was as concerned about getting everyone to like me as I was with helping people. In the type of church I led, each year the people vote to decide whether to allow the leader to keep his job. And the leaders I had met loved to brag about the unanimous affirming votes that they received from their people. So imagine my surprise when the votes came back, 31 yeses, one no, and <laughs> one abstention. It was at that moment that I realized what an unrealistic view I had of success and failure. And as I've helped leaders to grow and develop through the years, I've seen that most people are in the same boat. In Leadership Magazine, J. Wallace Hamilton states, Failure is far more common than success. Poverty is more prevalent than wealth. And disappointment more normal than arrival. Right now, you're getting the chance to sign up with me for a class you never got a chance to take in school, one on failure. Because in life, the question is not if you will have problems, but how you're going to deal with your problems. Are you going to fail forward or backward? When I think of people who were able to look trouble in the eye and forge ahead, one of the first who comes to my mind is Mary Kay Ash. I admire Mary Kay. She overcame a lot of obstacles in her career, and she never let failure get the better of her. Mary Kay's first career was in direct sales, and she was quite successful. But she also found that it was difficult for a woman to progress in a corporate world, especially in the 1950s and early 1960s. So after 25 years of success, she decided to retire. But that didn't last long. By the time a month passed, she was stir-crazy. She was ready to start her own business. She decided on a cosmetic business that would give every woman who worked in it unlimited opportunities. She purchased the formulas to the best beauty products she ever found, worked up a marketing plan, and prepared to set up her corporation. It didn't take long for her to hit her first obstacle. When she visited her attorney to set up her corporation, he insulted her and predicted her failure. She got similar treatment from her accountant. Despite their attempts to discourage her, she moved ahead. She sank her $5,000 life savings into her new business. She put her husband to work on the administrative side of things as she worked feverishly to prepare the product, design the packaging, write the training, and recruit consultants. But then a month before she was open for business, her husband died of a heart attack right at their kitchen table. Most people would never have been able to go on after that. But not Mary Kay. She kept going. And on September 13, 1963, she launched her business. Today, the company has over $1 billion in annual sales, employs 3,500 people, and empowers 500,000 direct sales consultants in 29 markets worldwide. Despite circumstances, obstacles, and hardship, Mary Kay Ash failed forward. I don't know what kind of obstacles you're facing in your life right now, but whatever they are, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that your life can change if you're willing to look at failure differently. You have the potential to overcome any problems, mistakes, or misfortunes. All you have to do is learn to fail forward. If you are ready to do that, let's begin right now. Step one in failing forward is to realize there is one major difference between average people and achieving people. Chapter 2. Get a New Definition of Failure and Success On August 6, 1999, a Major League Baseball player stepped up to home plate in Montreal and made another out, the 5,113th one of his professional career. If a player were to make all of those outs consecutively, he would play eight seasons without ever reaching first base. Was the player discouraged that night? No. You see, earlier in the same game, that player had reached a milestone that only 21 other people in the history of baseball have ever achieved. He had made his 3,000th hit. That player was Tony Gwynn of the San Diego Padres. During that game, 
Tony got on base with hits four times in five tries, but that's not the norm for him. Usually he fails to get a hit two times out of every three attempts. Those results may not sound very encouraging, but if you know baseball, you recognize that Tony's ability to succeed consistently only one time in three tries has made him the greatest hitter of his generation. And Tony recognizes that to get your hits, you've got to make a lot of outs. One of the greatest problems people have with failure is that they are too quick to judge isolated situations in their lives and label them as failures. Instead, they need to keep the bigger picture in mind. Someone like Tony Gwynn doesn't look at an out that he makes and think of failure. He sees it within the context of the bigger picture. His perspective leads to perseverance. His perseverance brings longevity. And his longevity gives him opportunities for success. If you can change your perspective on failure, it will help you to persevere and ultimately achieve your desires. So how should you judge failure? Let's start by taking a look at seven things failure is not. Number one, people think failure is avoidable. It's not. You've heard the saying, to err is human, to forgive divine. Alexander Pope wrote that over 250 years ago, and he was only paraphrasing a saying that was common 2,000 years ago during the time of the Romans. Things today are the same as they were then. If you're a human being, you're going to make mistakes. Number two, people think failure is an event. It's not. Growing up, I thought that success and failure came in a moment. The best example I can think of is taking a test. If you got an F, it meant you failed. But I've come to realize that failure is a process. If you flunk a test, it doesn't mean you just failed a one-time event. The F shows that you neglected the process leading up to the test. In 1997, I wrote a book called The Success Journey. The thesis of the book is that success is not a destination, not a place where you arrive one day. Instead, it is the journey you take. And whether or not you succeed comes from what you do day to day. In other words, success is a process. Failure works the same way. It's not some place you arrive. It's how you deal with life along the way. Truly, no one can conclude that he's failed until he breathes his last breath. Until then, he's still in process, and the jury is still out. Number three, people think failure is objective. It's not. When you err, what determines whether that action was a failure? The real answer is that you are the only person who can really label what you do a failure. It's subjective. Your perception of and response to your mistakes determine whether your actions are a failure. Number four, people think failure is the enemy. It's not. Most people try to avoid failure like a plague, but it takes adversity to create success. NBA coach Rick Pitino states it even more strongly. Failure is good, he says. It's fertilizer. Everything I've learned about coaching, I've learned from making mistakes. Number five, people think failure is irreversible. It's not. There's an old saying in Texas, it doesn't matter how much milk you spill as long as you don't lose your cow. In other words, mistakes are not irreversible. The problems come when you see only the spilled milk and not the bigger picture. People who see failure correctly take it in stride. Number six, people think failure is a stigma. It's not. Mistakes are not permanent markers. I love the perspective of Senator Sam Irvin, Jr. He remarked, defeat may serve as well as victory to shake the soul and let the glory out. That's the way we need to look at failure. When you make mistakes, don't let them get you down. And don't let yourself think of them as a stigma. Make each failure a step to success. Number seven, people think failure is final. It's not. Even what may appear to be a huge failure doesn't need to keep you from achieving. Take a look at the story of Sergio Zyman. Zyman, who successfully introduced Diet Coke, was also the same person who introduced New Coke. 
That move was an abysmal failure that lasted 79 days and cost the company about $100 million. People hated New Coke, and it caused Zyman to have to leave the company. But Zyman's problems with New Coke didn't keep him down. Eventually, the return of Coca-Cola Classic made the company even stronger, and in 1993, Zyman was hired back to the company. If you tend to focus on the extremes of success and failure and to fixate on particular events in your life, try to put things into perspective. When you do, you'll be able to share the philosophy of someone like the Apostle Paul who was able to say, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And that was saying a lot considering that Paul was shipwrecked, whipped, beaten, stoned, and imprisoned. Throughout everything, his faith enabled him to maintain perspective. The terrible truth is that all roads to achievement lead through the land of failure. It has stood firmly between every human being who had a dream and the realization of that dream. The trouble many people have is that they believe the process is supposed to be easy. The great American inventor Thomas Edison observed that attitude among people. He said, Failure is really a matter of conceit. People don't work hard because they imagine they'll succeed without ever making an effort. Most people believe that they'll wake up someday and find themselves rich. Actually, they've got it half right, because eventually they do wake up. Each of us has to make a choice. Are we going to sleep life away, avoiding failure at all costs? Or are we going to wake up and realize that failure is simply a price we pay to achieve success? If we learn to embrace that new definition of failure, then we are free to start moving ahead. Again, it's so important, let me repeat it. Failure is simply a price we pay to achieve success. And if we learn to embrace that new definition of failure, then we are free to start moving ahead. Recently, I had dinner with Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A restaurant chain, and his story is a great illustration of the price someone paid to achieve success. Like many young men of his era, Truett went into the Army. When he was discharged in 1945, he was ready to pursue opportunity. What appealed to him was a restaurant, and his dream was to work with Ben, one of his brothers. After learning a little about the business, they scraped together some money, located a site, and built and opened a restaurant. But it wouldn't be long before Truett faced the first of several major setbacks. The first came early, only three years after opening the restaurant. Truett's two brothers were in a small private plane that crashed on the way to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Both of them died. Truett was devastated. Once he got over the emotional shock, he went on alone. Two years later, he opened a second restaurant. By then, things were going pretty well. Then one night, he received a phone call that woke him, telling him there was a fire at his second restaurant location. He dashed off to see what could be done, but when he arrived, he discovered that the fire had totally destroyed the operation. Worse was the fact that he had practically no insurance. It wasn't but a few weeks later that Truett faced another debilitating setback. He discovered that he had polyps in his colon that would have to be removed. The timing couldn't be worse. Instead of rebuilding his restaurant, he went in for surgery. One operation turned into two, and much to his dismay, he was out of action for several months. But the time Truett spent out of commission inspired him to begin playing with a new concept. What would happen, he wondered, if he took the chicken breast which he had been selling in his restaurants, seasoned and fried it just right, and put it on a bun with the right condiments? The answer became the Chick-fil-A sandwich and the start of one of the largest privately owned restaurant chains in the world. Today, Truett Cathy is credited with inventing the chicken sandwich in the fast food industry, and Chick-fil-A operates over 900 restaurants across the country. In the year 2000, it became a billion-dollar company. Yet it never would have come to pass if Truett Cathy had not experienced the setbacks he did, maintained his perspective, and realized that a few negative experiences don't make for failure. If you can change the way you see failure, you gain the strength to keep running the race. Get a new definition of failure. See it as the price you pay for progress. If you can do that, you will put yourself in a much better position to fail forward. Step number two to failing forward, 
Learn a new definition of failure. Chapter 3. If you failed, are you a failure? In an interview years ago, advice columnist Ann Landers was asked by David Brinkley what question she is most frequently asked by readers. Her answer, what's wrong with me? Landers' response reveals a lot about human nature. Many people wrestle with feelings of failure, the most damaging being doubtful thoughts about themselves. At the heart of those doubts and feelings is one central question, am I a failure? And that's a problem, because I believe it's nearly impossible for any person to believe he or she is a failure and fail forward at the same time. The late Irma Bombeck, who wrote a widely syndicated weekly humor column until her death in 1996, had a great perspective on what it meant to fail forward without taking failure too personally. Irma Bombeck traveled a road in life that was filled with adversity, starting with her career. Her first job was as a copy girl at the Dayton Journal Herald when she was a teenager. But when she went off to college, a guidance counselor advised her to forget about writing. She refused. Later, she transferred to the University of Dayton and in 1949 graduated with a degree in English. Soon afterwards, she began working as a writer for the obituary column and the woman's page. In 1964, Bombeck was able to convince the editor of a small neighborhood newspaper to let her write a weekly humor column, and that opened the door for her. By 1967, her column was syndicated and carried by over 900 newspapers. For just over 30 years, Irma Bombeck wrote her humor column. During that time, she published 15 books, received 15 honorary degrees, and was recognized as one of the 25 most influential women in America. But during that span of time, she also experienced incredible trials, including infertility, breast cancer, a mastectomy, the death of two children, and kidney failure. But she wasn't shy about sharing her perspective on her life experiences. She said, What you have to tell yourself is, I'm not a failure. I failed at doing something. Now, there's a big difference. Personally and career-wise, it's been a corduroy road. I've buried babies, lost parents, had cancer, and worried over kids. The trick is to put it all in perspective, and that's what I do for a living. That point of view kept Irma Bombach going and writing through all the disappointments and pain. Every successful person is someone who failed, yet never looked at himself as a failure. For example, Wolfgang Mozart was told by Emperor Ferdinand that his opera, The Marriage of Figaro, was far too noisy and contained far too many notes. Vincent van Gogh sold only one painting in his lifetime. Thomas Edison was considered unteachable, and Albert Einstein was told by a Munich schoolmaster that he would never amount to much. I think it's safe to say that all great achievers are given multiple reasons to believe they were failures. But in spite of that, they persevere. In the face of adversity, rejection, and failure, they continue believing in themselves and refuse to look at themselves as failures. There are seven abilities achievers possess that enable them to fail, not take it personally, and keep moving forward. Number one, achievers reject rejection. People don't give up trying because they don't base their self-worth on their performance. Instead, they have an internally based self-image. Rather than saying, I am a failure, they say, I missed that one, or I made a mistake. To keep the right perspective, take responsibility for your actions, but don't take failure personally. Number two, achievers see failure as temporary. For example, Take the case of United States President Harry S. Truman. In 1922, he was 38 years old, in debt and out of work. In 1945, he was the most powerful leader of the free world, occupying the highest office in the land. If he had seen failure as permanent, he would have remained stuck and never would have kept trying and believing in his potential. Number three, achievers see failures as isolated incidents. When achievers fail... They see it as a momentary event, not a lifelong epidemic. 
It's not personal. So if you want to succeed, don't let any one incident color your view of yourself. Number four, achievers keep expectations realistic. Something that happened on baseball's opening day in 1954 illustrates this point well. The Milwaukee Braves and the Cincinnati Reds played one another, and a rookie for each team made their major league debuts during that game. The rookie who played for the Reds hit four doubles and helped his team win with a score of 9-8. to eight. The rookie for the Braves went 0-5. for five. The Reds player was Jim Greengrass, a name that you may never have heard. The other guy, who didn't get a hit, might be more familiar to you. His name was Hank Aaron. If Aaron's expectations for that first game had been unrealistic, who knows? He might have given up baseball. Surely he wasn't happy about his performance that day, but he didn't think of himself as a failure. He wasn't about to give up easily. Number five, achievers focus on strengths. Another way achievers keep themselves from personalizing failure is by focusing on their strengths. Bob Butera, president of the New Jersey Devils hockey team, was asked what makes a winner. He answered that what distinguishes winners from losers is that winners concentrate at all times on what they can do, not on what they can't do. If a weakness is a matter of character, it needs much attention. Focus on it until you shore it up. Otherwise, the best bet for failing forward is to develop and maximize your strengths. Number six. Achievers vary approaches to achievement. In The Psychology of Achievement, Brian Tracy writes about four millionaires who made their fortunes by age 35. They were involved in an average of 17 businesses before finding that one that took them to the top. They kept trying and changing until they found something that worked for them. Achievers are willing to vary their approaches to problems. Number seven, achievers bounce back. Psychologist Simone Carruthers says life is a series of outcomes. Sometimes the outcome is what you want. Great. Figure out what you did right. Sometimes the outcome is what you don't want. Great. Figure out what you did wrong so that you don't do it again. That's the key to bouncing back. That's the way to take yourself out of failure. One of the best stories I've ever heard of someone who refused to take failure personally is that of Daniel Rudiger. You may have seen the film, which was based on his life, called Rudy. The first of 14 children in a poor working-class family, Rudy loved football as a kid and believed that might be his ticket out of Joliet, Illinois. But his heart was much greater than his physique. He was slow, and at 5 feet 6 inches tall and 190 pounds, he wasn't exactly built for the game. As a senior, he began dreaming about attending Notre Dame and playing football there. But Rudy faced another problem. His grade showed less promise even than his physique. And for the next several years, Rudy changed his focus from one thing to another. He was more determined than ever to go to Notre Dame despite the criticism of his family, friends, and co-workers. He knew that he was not a failure, and he would find a way to go to South Bend. Eventually, Rudy quit his job, moved to South Bend, and managed to get into Holy Cross College, a community college affiliated with the university. He attended the college for two years and earned a four-point average every semester before Notre Dame accepted him. He entered his dream school at age 26, eight years after graduating from high school. With two years of sports eligibility remaining, he went out for football. He made the team as a scrub, one of the warm bodies that they put in practice to keep the good players sharp. But Rudy worked hard anyway. And in the final game of his final season, Rudy got to live his dream by getting into a game as a player. In the movie, Rudy Rudiger gets in for only one play at the end of the game. But that's not how it really happened. In real life, he had two chances to get the quarterback. The first play, he was too anxious and didn't execute the play. He failed. But once again, Rudy didn't let his failure make him a failure. He was determined to fail forward. When they snapped the ball the second time, he put the moves he'd rehearsed in his mind on the guy over him, and he sacked the quarterback. Overjoyed, the team carried him off the field in celebration. Rudy says it's the only time that has happened to a player in the history of Notre Dame football. 
The great thing about Rudy's story is that he doesn't have the athletic ability of Michael Jordan, nor is he a genius like Mozart, Van Gogh, Edison, or Einstein. He's just a regular person like you and me. The only reason he's an achiever instead of average is that he refused to let failure get the better of him. He learned that no matter how many times you fail, it doesn't have to make you a failure. Step number three to failing forward. Remove the you from failure. Chapter four. You're too old to cry, but it hurts too much to laugh. Just about everyone has heard of the Wright brothers. But what you may not know is that the Wrights, unknown with no university education, were not the leaders in aviation. They were obscure at best, and another man was expected to put the first manned airplane into the air. His name was Dr. Samuel Langley, an accomplished thinker, scientist, and inventor. He had published several important works on aerodynamics, and he possessed a vision for achieving man flight. In 1898, he approached the United States War Department for funding to design and build an airplane to carry a man aloft, and they gave him a commission of $50,000, a huge sum at that time. His success seemed inevitable. On October the 8th, 1903, Langley expected his years of work to come to fruition. As journalists and curious onlookers watched, Charles Manley, the engineer who built the plane's engine, strode across the deck of a modified houseboat and climbed into the pilot's seat of a craft called the Great Aerodrome. The full-size motorized device was perched atop a spatially built catapult designed to initiate the aerodrome flight into the air. But when they attempted the launch, part of the aerodrome got caught and the biplane was flung into 16 feet of water a mere 50 yards away from the boat. At first, Langley didn't let that failure or the accompanying criticism deter him. Eight weeks later, in early December, he and Manley were ready to attempt the flight again. They had made numerous modifications to the aerodrome, and once more Manley climbed in the cockpit from the houseboat's deck, ready to make history. But as before, disaster struck. This time the cable supports to the wing snapped as the plane was launched. The craft caught again on the launch rail, and it plunged into the river upside down. Manley nearly died. Langley said afterward, I have brought to a close the portion of the work which seemed to be specifically mine. In other words, Langley had given up. Just two weeks later, Orville and Wilbur Wright, uneducated, unknown, and unfunded, flew their plane Kitty Hawk over the sand dunes of North Carolina. What happened in the life of Samuel Langley occurs in the lives of many people today. They allow failure to get the better of them emotionally, and it stops them from achieving their dreams. Let's face it, failure can be very painful, sometimes physically and more often emotionally. Seeing part of your vision fall flat really hurts. And if people heap ridicule on top of your own hurt feelings, you feel even worse. For many people, the pain of failure leads to fear of failure. And if fear overcomes you, it's almost impossible to fail forward. The inaction that results when people are stopped by fear takes on many forms. Here are the three most common ones I've observed. Number one, paralysis. Some people simply stop trying to do anything that might lead to failure. President Harry S. Truman said, The worst danger we face is the danger of being paralyzed by doubts and fears. People whose fear paralyzes them give up any hope of moving forward. Number two, procrastination. Other people maintain the hope of progress but simply never get around to following through. Procrastination steals a person's time productivity, and potential. As President John F. Kennedy said, there are risks and costs to a program of action, but they are far less than the long-range risk and cost of comfortable inaction. Procrastination is too high a price to pay for fear of failure. Number three, purposelessness. Tom Peters, co-author of In Search of Excellence, says there's nothing more useless than someone who comes to the end of the day and congratulates himself, saying, Well, 
I made it through the day without screwing up. Yet that's what many people who fear failure do. Rather than pursuing worthy objectives, they avoid the pain of making mistakes. And in the midst of that transition, they lose sight of any sense of purpose that they might have once possessed. As fear of failure and the resulting inactivity compounds, people exhibit additional negative side effects like self-pity, excuses, misused energy, and feelings of hopelessness. Many people are unable to overcome their fear because they focus on the wrong thing. They believe that what started their cycle of fear is the thing they should avoid to end it. But the problem is, you can't avoid fear, and you can't wait for motivation to get you going. To conquer fear, you have to feel the fear and take action anyway. Playwright George Bernard Shaw said, A life spent in making mistakes is not only more honorable but more useful than a life spent doing nothing. To overcome fear, you have to be willing to know that much of your life will be spent making mistakes. The bad news is that if you've been inactive for a long time, getting started is hard to do. The good news is that as soon as you start moving, it gets easier. If you can get going and keep making mistakes, you gain experience. That experience eventually brings competence. And eventually, you will also make fewer mistakes. And as a result, your fear will become less paralyzing. But the whole process starts with action. To get over fear, you've got to get started. Many unsuccessful people get paralyzed by fear. But the same thing also happens to high achievers. For example, when you look at the life of one of the great composers, George Frederick Handel, you see a successful person who found himself in a rut that he desperately needed to break out of. Handel was a musical prodigy. But despite Handel's talent and fame, he faced considerable adversity. Competition with rival English composers was fierce. Audiences were fickle and sometimes didn't turn out for his performances. And he was frequently the victim of the changing political winds of the time. Several times he found himself penniless and on the verge of bankruptcy. And the pain and rejection of failure was difficult. Then his problems were compounded by failing health. He suffered a stroke which left his right arm limp and caused him to lose the use of four fingers on his right hand. And though he recovered, it left him despondent. Finally, in 1741, at only 56 years old, Handel decided that it was time to retire. He was discouraged, miserable, and consumed with debt. So on April 8, he gave what he considered his farewell concert. Disappointed and filled with self-pity, he gave up. But in August of that year, something incredible happened. A wealthy friend named Charles Jennings visited Handel and gave him a libretto based on the life of Christ. The work intrigued Handel, enough to stir him to action. He began writing, and immediately the floodgates of inspiration opened in him. His cycle of inactivity was broken. For 21 days, he wrote almost nonstop. Then he spent another two days creating the orchestration. In 24 days, he had completed the 260-page manuscript. He called the piece Messiah. When it comes to getting over the emotional hurts of failure, it really doesn't matter how good or bad your personal history is. The only thing that matters is that you face your fear and get moving. Do that, and you give yourself the opportunity to learn how to fail forward. Step number four to failing forward, take action and reduce your fear. Chapter 5. Find the Exit Off of the Failure Freeway Business professors Gary Hamill and C.K. Prahalad have written about an experiment that was conducted with a group of monkeys. It's a great story of failure. They say that four monkeys were placed in a room that had a tall pole in the center of it. Suspended from the top of that pole was a bunch of bananas. One of the hungry monkeys started climbing the pole to get something to eat. But just as he reached out to grab a banana, he was doused with a torrent of cold water. Squealing, he scampered down the pole and abandoned his attempt to feed himself. Each monkey made a similar attempt, and each one was drenched with cold water. After making several attempts, they finally gave up. Then researchers removed one of the monkeys from the room and replaced him with a new monkey. 
As the newcomer began to climb the pole, the other three grabbed him and pulled him down to the ground. After trying to climb the pole several times and being dragged down by the others, he finally gave up and never attempted to climb the pole again. One by one, the researchers replaced the original monkeys with the new ones, and each time a new monkey was brought in, he would be dragged down by the others before he could reach the bananas. In time, the room was filled with monkeys who had never received a cold shower. None of them would climb the pole, but none of them knew why. Unfortunately, people who have gotten used to failure can be a lot like those monkeys. They make the same mistakes over and over, yet they are never quite sure of why, and as a result, they never seem to get off of what I call the failure freeway. The old saying is true. If you always do what you've always done, then you will always get what you've always gotten. What starts people down the failure freeway is a common mistake, failure, or mess up. But people who stay on the failure freeway don't think that it's their fault. They see every obstacle or error as somebody else's fault. And as a result, they generally respond in one or more of the following ways. Number one, they blow up. One of the reactions to failure that keeps people driving on the failure freeway is anger. You've probably seen it. People make a minor mistake and angrily overreact to it, taking out their frustration on themselves or others around them. But if a person doesn't govern his temper, it will govern him. Number two, they cover up. People's desire to make sure others don't see their mistakes isn't always so humorous. For example, take the case of Nicholas Leeson. In 1995, the 28-year-old worked for the British bank bearings. He controlled huge amounts of money for the organization, which he tried to increase through what's called casino-style investing. When Leeson's dealings resulted in huge losses, he covered them up and made even riskier trades to try to recoup his losses. Ultimately, his actions cost Barings $1.3 billion. He single-handedly put one of the oldest banks in the world out of business. It's in the nature of people to try to cover up their mistakes. That tendency is as old as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But anyone who wants to get off the failure freeway needs to fess up rather than cover up. Number three, they speed up. People who are particularly stubborn will sometimes try to leave their troubles behind by working harder and faster, but without changing their direction. They're like the person trying to get the square peg into the round hole, who first tries to place the peg into the hole and then tries to shove it in, then takes a hammer and tries to pound it in. They're working hard, but getting nowhere. Number four, they back up. When my wife Margaret and I were raising our two children, we found that our son had a mind and a will of his own. And when he did something wrong, his first move was to lie. Then he'd back up and try to cover it up. I can still picture his offended expression as he emphatically denied having eaten the chocolate candy with his nine-year-old face smeared with chocolate. Margaret and I worked very hard to break him of that inclination. I'm relieved that today my boy Joel is a man, and when he's wrong, he admits it. And that's good, because nobody can exit off the failure freeway if he keeps backing up. Number five, they give up. If you stay on the failure freeway long enough, you eventually slow up. It's similar to what happens on the Interstate 285 loop around my hometown of Atlanta at rush hour gridlock. And that's when a lot of people simply give up. Personal growth expert Paul J. Meyer believes that 90% of all those who fail are not actually defeated, they simply quit. There's really only one solution to the gridlock you find on the failure freeway, and that's to wake up and find the exit. To leave the road of continual failure, a person must first utter the three most difficult words to say, I was wrong. He has to open his eyes, admit his mistakes, and accept complete responsibility for his current wrong actions and attitudes. Every failure you experience is a fork in the road. It's an opportunity to take the right action, learn from your mistakes, and begin again. The only way to exit the failure freeway and see the new territory of achievement is to take full responsibility for yourself and your mistakes. 
As Michael Corda, editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster, says, success on any major scale requires you to accept responsibility. In the final analysis, the one quality that all successful people have is the ability to take on responsibility. The fight to take responsibility occurs within, and rarely does talent, intelligence, or opportunity make the difference in whether a person wins that battle. What it takes is character. That's why Stuart B. Johnson said that our business in life is not to get ahead of others, but to get ahead of ourselves. But unfortunately, not everyone learns the lesson of accepting responsibility for their actions. One of the most unusual stories I've ever encountered about someone on the failure freeway is that of Rosie Ruiz. Back in 1980, she was the first woman to cross the finish line of the Boston Marathon with the third fastest woman's time ever. But from the moment that she finished the race, people were suspicious of her victory. The person most shocked was Jacqueline Garrow. Though not favored to win the race, Garrow had been training to run it for three years. And during the course of the race, she had pulled ahead of all the other women. But about a mile from the finish line, another woman suddenly appeared, running ahead of her. And that other woman, Ruiz, finished before her and was declared the woman's winner. The race officials were suspicious, and they immediately began to investigate. They found that Ruiz had qualified for the Boston Marathon by obtaining a fraudulent qualifying finish for the New York Marathon. They surmised that in the Boston race, Ruiz had simply jumped into a group of runners a mile from the finish line, never suspecting that she was actually ahead of all the other women. The Boston Athletic Association disqualified her, and a week later, they awarded Garrow the winner's medal. What's most amazing that is even years later, Ruiz still hadn't learned from her mistake. At a 10-kilometer race in Miami, Garrow saw Ruiz and tried to talk to her to clear the air, but Ruiz denied ever cheating in Boston. Two years after her appearance in the Boston Marathon, Ruiz was arrested and charged with stealing cash and checks from her employer. A year later, she was convicted for trying to sell two kilos of cocaine to an undercover police officer. As Sir Josiah Stamp said, It is easy to dodge our responsibilities, but we cannot dodge the consequences. I don't know what Rosie Ruiz is doing today. Back then, Ruiz was doing a lot of moving, but she wasn't getting anywhere. Let's hope that she finally found the exit off of the failure freeway. Step number five to failing forward. Change your response to failure by accepting responsibility. Let's take a moment and review the first five steps of failing forward, because it's my desire to teach you when you fail to fail forward instead of backwards. Step number one, realize that there is one major difference between average people and achieving people. Step number two, learn a new definition of failure. Step number three, remove the you from failure. Step number four, take action and reduce your fear. And step number five, change your response to failure by accepting responsibility. Chapter six, no matter what happens to you, failure is an inside job. When you learn to accept responsibility for yourself, your problems and your failures, you are better prepared to fail forward. But what about when you're faced with overwhelming difficulties that you didn't create and you cannot control. At no time in life are people more prone to allow failure to make them give up than when external circumstances cause extreme hardship or grief. But ultimately, no matter whether the difficulty is self-created or comes from somewhere outside of you, failure is created within the person. It is always an inside job. Many people desire to control the circumstances of their lives, but the truth is that we cannot determine what will come our way. We can't control the hands we're dealt, only how we play the cards. South African General Jan Christian Smuts said, A man is not defeated by his opponents, but by himself. That's true. No matter how daunting the circumstances of your life may be, the greatest battle you wage against failure occurs on the inside, not the outside. How do you fight that battle? You start by cultivating the right attitude. You're probably familiar with Murphy's Law, which says, 
If anything bad can happen, it will, and at the worst possible time. And then there's the Peter principle, which says people always rise to the level of their incompetence. There's another saying similar to those called the law of human behavior. It says, sooner or later, we get just what we expect. I have a question to ask you. Is the law of human behavior optimistic or pessimistic? Stop and think about your answer. I say that because your response reveals your attitude. If you expect the worst out of a life, then you probably said the law was written by a pessimist. If you have a positive outlook, then you probably answered optimist, because the prospect of getting what you expect is very encouraging to you. Your attitude determines your outlook. The first element in winning the internal battle against failure is to maintain a positive outlook. University of Pennsylvania psychology professor Martin Seligman, who has studied employees in 30 different industries, observes that people who bounce back are optimists. Let's face it, not everyone is naturally optimistic. Some people are born seeing the glass half empty rather than half full. But no matter what your natural bent is, you can become a more optimistic person. How do you cultivate optimism? By learning the secret of contentment. If you can learn that, then no matter what happens to you, you can weather the storm and build on the good that you find in any situation. There are a lot of misconceptions about contentment. Let's talk about what it's not. Number one, it's not containing your emotions. We all experience negative emotions. And while you don't want to let your emotions run amok, you shouldn't try to stuff them either. Denial doesn't help you become content. In fact, your emotions will come out eventually, even if you try to bury them. Number two, it's not maintaining your current situation. My dad, who was a pastor for many years, used to tell the story about a farmer in one of his churches who refused to improve himself. Dad would try to encourage and cajole him, but he said the old man just wouldn't change. His response to my father was always the same. I'm not making much progress, but I'm well established. One day my father was driving past that man's farm, and he saw that the old farmer's tractor was stuck in the mud. No matter what the man did, mud just flew and the tractor stayed put. After the old farmer gave it one more try and was no better off than he had been before, he started cussing up a storm. At that point, my dad rolled down his window and hollered out to the man, Well, you're not making much progress, but you certainly are well established. Being content doesn't mean being satisfied with a bad situation. It simply means having a good attitude as you work your way out of it. Number three, it's not attaining position, power, or possessions. In our culture, too many people believe that contentment comes from attaining material possessions or positions of power. But they aren't the keys of contentment either. If you are tempted to believe that they are, remember the words of John D. Rockefeller. When a journalist asked him how much wealth was enough, the millionaire, who was at that time one of the richest and most powerful men in the world, answered, Just a little more. True contentment comes from having a positive attitude. It means... Expecting the best in everything, not the worst. Remaining upbeat even when you get beat up. Seeing solutions in every problem, not problems in every solution. Believing in yourself, even when others don't. And holding on to hope, even when others say it's hopeless. No matter what happens to you, a positive attitude comes from within. Your circumstances and your contentment are unrelated. Failure is an inside job, and so is success. If you want to achieve, you have to win the war in your own thinking first. You can't let failure outside of you get inside of you. You certainly can't control the length of your life, but you can control its width and depth. You can't control the contour of your face, but you can control its expression. You can't control the weather, but you can control the atmosphere of your mind. Why worry about things you can't control when you can keep yourself busy controlling the things that depend on you? Right now you may be saying, That's all well and good for you, John. You haven't experienced what I have. If you still have a hard time believing that failure is really an inside job, then you need to hear the story of someone who maintained a winner's attitude while overcoming the most difficult of circumstances. 
His name is Roger Crawford. He makes his living as a consultant and public speaker. He's written two books. He travels all across the country working with Fortune 500 companies, national and state associations, and school districts. Those aren't bad credentials. But if that doesn't impress you, how about this? Before becoming a consultant, he was a professional tennis player certified by the United States Professional Tennis Association. Still not impressed? Would you change your opinion if I told you that Roger had no hands and only one foot? Roger Crawford was born with a condition called ectrodactylism. When he emerged from his mother's womb, the doctor saw that he had a thumb-like projection extending out of his right forearm and a thumb and a finger growing out of his left forearm. He had no palms. His legs and arms were shortened, and his left leg possessed a shrunken foot with only three toes. His foot was amputated when he was five. Roger's parents were told by various medical professionals that he would never be able to walk, probably would not be able to take care of himself, and would never lead a normal life. But Roger's parents were determined to give him the best chance possible for living a normal life. They raised him to feel loved, to be strong, and to develop independence. You're only as handicapped as you want to be, his father used to tell him. Roger appreciated the encouragement and training that he received from his parents. But I don't think he really understood the significance of it or his achievements until he was in college and he interacted with someone who wanted to meet him. He had received a phone call from a man who had read about his tennis victories, and Crawford agreed to meet him at a nearby restaurant. When Roger stood up to shake hands with the man, he discovered that the other guy had hands that were almost identical to his. That got Crawford excited, because he thought he had found someone similar to him, but older, who could act as his mentor. But after talking with the stranger for a few minutes, he realized that he was wrong. Roger says, Instead, what I found was someone with a bitter, pessimistic attitude who blamed all of life's disappointments and failures on his anatomy. I soon recognized that our lives and attitudes couldn't have been more different. His attitude was, the world owes me, and his problem was that the world disagreed. He was even angry with me because I didn't share his despair. The two kept in touch for several years until it dawned on Roger that even if some miracle were suddenly to give the other man a perfect body, his unhappiness and lack of success wouldn't change. He would still be at the same place in his life. That man had allowed failure to seize him from the inside, while Roger had mastered the art of failing forward. Chances are that the adversity in your life has been nowhere near as difficult as Roger Crawford's has been. And that's why his story is such an inspiration— Roger maintains that handicaps can only disable us if we let them. He says that's true not only of physical challenges, but of emotional and intellectual ones as well. He believes that the real and lasting limitations are created in our minds, not our bodies. In other words, no matter what happens, failure is an inside job. Step number six to failing forward. Don't let failure from outside get inside of you. Chapter 7. Is the Past Holding Your Life Hostage? When I get a bit of time off, one of the things I like to do is play golf. Now, I'm not a great golfer. I'd say I'm average, but no matter what, I'm glad to get started golfing. And I can tell you who it was that got me interested in the sport. Arnold Palmer. Many people of my generation became golfers because of Arnold Palmer. His down-to-earth attitude, sparkling personality, rugged good looks, and incredible playing ability caused him to draw huge crowds of spectators who would follow him from hole to hole. Back then, they were dubbed Arnie's Army, and it seemed they'd follow him anywhere to get a chance to see the man they called the King perform on the course. It was a first for golf, and it was sure fun to watch. One of the things about golf is that anyone can have a really bad hole even a Hall of Famer like Arnold Palmer. The key to playing through it is to forget about your bad shots. But that can be a difficult thing to do, especially when someone erects a bronze monument to your bad hole. And that's what happened to Arnold Palmer. At the 1961 Los Angeles Open, 
on a par 5 ninth hole, Palmer hit a good drive and wanted to try to put the ball on the green with the second shot. With his three-wood, Palmer hit what he believed was a good shot, but as the ball sailed, it faded to the right, hit a pole, and bounced out of bounds onto the driving range. Palmer dropped a ball, took a penalty stroke, and tried again. He hit another ball out of bounds. Again, he dropped a ball and took a penalty stroke. He kept repeating this process until he finally put the ball on the green. By then, he had accumulated ten strokes. It took him two more strokes with his putter to hold the ball. He finished with a twelve. And because of that, he went from a few strokes behind the leaders to scoring so poorly that he was out of the tournament. Today, nearly 40 years later, if you go to the ninth hole at the Rancho Park Golf Course in Los Angeles, you will find a bronze plaque that states, On Friday, January 6, 1961, the first day of the 35th Los Angeles Open, Arnold Palmer, voted golfer of the year and pro athlete of the year, took a 12 on this hole. However, good golfers don't dwell on bad performances, not if they want to remain good golfers. And that has always been true of Arnold Palmer. Once when asked about his performance at the Open on hole 9, he commented, That doggone plaque will be there long after I'm gone. But you have to put things like that behind you. That's one of the wonderful things about golf. Your next shot can be as good or bad as the last one, but you'll always get another chance. The same quality that makes professional golfers effective enables any person to overcome failure and become a strong achiever. The ability to put past events behind them and move on. That quality positions a person to tackle current challenges with enthusiasm and a minimum of hindering personal baggage. In contrast, people who are unable to get over previous hurts and failures are held hostage by their past. The baggage they carry around makes it very difficult for them to move forward. It may sound like I'm making light of what happened to you in the past. I'm not. I know that people suffer genuine tragedies in this imperfect world. They lose children, spouses, parents, and friends, sometimes under horrible circumstances. People contract cancer, multiple sclerosis, AIDS, and other debilitating diseases. They suffer unspeakable abuses at the hands of others. All of those things are true. But tragedies don't have to stop a person from possessing a positive outlook, being productive, and living life to the fullest. One man is born with severe handicaps and decides the world owes him, while another, such as Roger Crawford, goes on to become a tennis pro. One person who contracts AIDS bitterly gives up on life, while another, such as basketball's Magic Johnson, builds his business and enjoys his family life. One woman experiences rape and withdrawals into herself, while another, such as Kelly McGillis, overcomes the experience and becomes a successful actress in Hollywood. No matter how dark a person's past is, it need not color his or her present permanently. In my experience, the problems of people's past impact them in one of two ways. They experience either a breakdown or a breakthrough. Listen to the following five characteristics. They are signs that a person hasn't gotten over past difficulties. Number one, comparison. If you hear people continually talk about how much harder they've had it than anyone else, chances are they are allowing themselves to be held hostage by their past. Their motto is similar to something Quentin Crisp once said, Never keep up with the Joneses. Drag them down to your level. It's cheaper. Number two, rationalization. Another characteristic of people trapped by their past is believing that there are good reasons not to get over past difficulties. The problem is that rationalizing creates a fog that hinders people from finding solutions to their problems. Excuses, no matter how strong, never lead to achievement. Number three, isolation. Some people withdraw due to their past hurts. For many, it's like a natural reflex that kicks in for self-protection. It is especially sad when people who are naturally outgoing isolate themselves due to their past because they become especially miserable. Number four, regret. One of the greatest hindrances to living life in the present is regret. It saps a person's energy and leaves little that enables him or her to do anything positive. Number five, bitterness. 
Anyone who doesn't get past the problem or the pain of the past eventually becomes bitter. It is the inevitable consequence of not processing through old injuries and tragedies. But no matter what you've experienced, remember this. There are people who had it better than you, but who have done worse. And there are people who have had it worse than you, but who've done better. The circumstances really have nothing to do with getting over your personal history. Past hurts can make you bitter or better. The choice is yours. Every major difficulty you face in life is a fork in the road. You choose which track you will head down toward breakdown or breakthrough. It is a turning point, but you determine which way you will turn. If you've been badly hurt, then start by acknowledging the pain and grieving any loss that you may have experienced. Then forgive the people involved, including yourself if needed. That will help you move on. I understand that it may be very difficult to go through this process, but you can do it. Just think. Today may be your day to turn the hurts of your past into a breakthrough for the future. Don't allow anything from your personal history to keep holding you hostage. Step number seven to failing forward. Say goodbye to yesterday. Chapter 8 who is this person who keeps making these mistakes? Sometimes great achievement can come only as the result of a period of failure that helps you understand who you really are. That was the case of John James Audubon, the man for whom the National Audubon Society was named. His life was one of great extremes, problems and progress, struggle and success, failure and fanfare. Listen to his story. The son of a French sea captain, Audubon was born in Haiti in 1785, but spent his formative years in France. He was educated as a gentleman, but was at best an indifferent student. His real passion was hunting and drawing birds. At 18, Audubon was sent to America, where he moved into a house his father owned in Pennsylvania. There he honed his skills as a woodsman. He continued hunting and drawing wildlife and it wasn't long before he met and developed a relationship with a neighboring family named the Bakewells. That had a significant impact on his life. First, he fell in love with one of the family's daughters, Lucy, and second, in 1807, he started working in the counting house of Benjamin Bakewell's import company. That was the start of what would become an abysmal career in business. Over the next 15 years, Audubon embarked on a series of unsuccessful ventures, his first venture, which dealt in indigo dye, lost him a small fortune. He then worked in the import business for a while, but after meeting no success, decided to try his hand at retail trade. With another young businessman, he set up shop in Louisville, Kentucky. But six months later, the two had only minimal success. They decided to move their location to Missouri in hopes of getting more business. Audubon only lasted six more months in that endeavor. He sold his share in the shop to his partner and went in search of another opportunity. In 1811, he tried his hand at the import business. He and his brother-in-law established a commission house in New Orleans importing goods from England. Unfortunately, they did this on the eve of the War of 1812, and their business failed. So Audubon went back to work in trading goods. He saw some success there, but then made the poor decision to open a steam sawmill and gristmill in an area that could not support such a large operation. In 1819, the business had gone bankrupt. All through the years, two things had remained constant in Audubon's life, hunting and art. Now he had to rely on both to survive. His gun put food on the table for his small family, and he drew portraits on commission to bring in money. By default, rather than design, his hobby became his means of support. It was then, in 1820, that Audubon had what he called his great idea. He decided to create a comprehensive and complete printed collection of all American birds based on his paintings. They would be life-size and shown in their natural surroundings. For the next few years, he traveled and added more painted birds to his portfolio, while Lucy worked as a tutor and a governess in Louisiana. In 1826, when he had enough material, Audubon sailed to Liverpool, England, and immediately met with great success. It didn't take long for Ottoman to get connected with engraver Robert Havel, and together they began printing the remarkable Birds of America, 
a series of 100 color plates in a large 29 by 39 inch format. Nothing else like it had ever been created, nor has any other book of print since been so revered. In all, they printed about 200 copies of that first edition. Today, it's considered a masterpiece. An original Birds of America, which sold for $1,000 in the 1820s, is now worth about $5 million. John James Audubon was unsuccessful for most of his life. It took him until he was 35 years old to figure out what his problem was. Himself. He was a terrible businessman, and he didn't belong in trade. It didn't matter how many times he changed locations, partners, or business types, not until he understood and changed himself did he have a chance at success. Evangelist D.L. Moody was once asked which people gave him the most trouble. His response was, I've had more trouble with Dwight L. Moody than any other man alive. Television host Jack Parr echoed the same thought when he said, Looking back, my life seems like one long obstacle race, with me as its chief obstacle. If you are continually experiencing trouble or facing obstacles, then you should check to make sure that you are not the problem. People don't like to admit that they need to change, and if they are willing to alter things about themselves, they usually focus on cosmetic changes. Why are people so hesitant to change? I believe that some, like Ottoman, believe they are supposed to pursue a particular course of action, even though it doesn't suit their gifts and talents. And when they are not working in areas of strength, they do poorly. Others are not self-aware and don't even know what their strengths are. The psychologist Sheldon Kopp says, All of the significant battles are waged within the self. To have an opportunity to reach your potential, you must know who you are and face your flaws. Allow me to help you do that. Go through the following process. First, see yourself clearly. Bishop Fulton Sheen said, Most of us do not like to look inside ourselves for the same reason we don't like to open a letter that has bad news. Most people see all the bad and deny the good, or they see all the good and deny the bad. To reach your potential, you must see both. Second, admit your flaws honestly. In Chapter 5, I stated that you must take responsibility for your actions to fail forward. But you must also take responsibility for who you are as a person. That means owning up to what you cannot do, should not do, or ought not to do. Third, discover your strengths joyfully. Working on your strengths is the next step in the process. No one ever achieved his dreams working outside of his areas of gifting. To excel, do what you do well. Fourth, build on your strengths passionately. Like Audubon, you will improve only if you enthusiastically develop whatever God-given abilities you have. You can reach your potential tomorrow if you dedicate yourself to growth today. Remember, to change your world, you must first change yourself. One of the greatest stories of change that I know of personally involves someone very close to me in my organization, the Enjoy Group, and it's my assistant, Linda Edgers. If you've ever heard me speak in person, then you've probably heard me talk about Linda. I believe Linda is the finest executive assistant in the country, but I haven't always felt that way about her. A few years ago, we experienced a rocky time in our history, and the fact that we work together now is a strong testament to her willingness and ability to take a hard look at herself, make some changes in her life, and become the kind of person she desired to be. Linda first began working for me in the mid-1980s when I was leading Skyline Church in San Diego. She began working in the church's financial office. When she attended a conference of mine on leadership, Linda realized that she felt called to work full-time with me at Enjoy. She approached me after the conference and shared her thoughts with me. Later, when Enjoy was big enough, we brought her on staff. Linda immediately became an impact player for us. Under the leadership of Dick Peterson, now the COO of the Enjoy Group and president of the Enjoy Conferences and Resources, Linda did whatever was asked of her and That was just about everything. As we grew, she took on greater and greater responsibility, and by the early 1990s, she was Dick's right hand. Then suddenly, one day, Linda quit. She gave two weeks' notice, and she was gone. She didn't give any explanation. She just simply bailed on us. Dick and I were shocked. A few weeks later, I found out that Linda had gone to work for an accountant friend of mine as his secretary. 
I was amazed because she had always been passionate about the kind of work we did. Then something even more surprising happened. I started to hear that Linda was getting very negative, and she was saying critical things about me and Enjoy. And that saddened me because I always liked her. Meanwhile, life went on. Dick hired someone to replace Linda, and the company continued growing. Then about eight months later, I got a phone call telling me Linda wanted to see me. On the day that she came to my office, I noticed that she was shaking. And as she talked, she started to cry. First, she apologized for all the negative things that she had been saying. And then she told me why she had quit and what had led to her feelings of bitterness. Dick and I talked about it, and we offered to hire her back but it would be in a different capacity. The only thing available at the time was a position taking incoming calls and answering correspondence. It must have been difficult for Linda, who had once been Dick's second-in-command, but she accepted because she really wanted to work at Enjoy. And for three years, Linda worked hard and did everything asked of her with excellence and a positive attitude. And over time, she began to assist Dick more and more. When I left the pastorate at Skyline in 1995 to devote myself full-time to the Enjoy Group, I needed to hire a new assistant, and one of the people I considered was Linda. I knew she was highly competent. The only issue I needed to settle was whether I could trust her unconditionally. It didn't take me long to settle the issue. I knew I wanted Linda to be my assistant. If you would ask Linda today, she'd tell you that the turning point for her was the day that she looked at herself in the mirror and realized that she needed to make some changes in her life, starting with her attitude. She knows that if she hadn't, she never would have gotten the opportunity to do the work that God put her here to do. Linda continues to amaze me. I marvel at what she is capable of doing, and every time I make a positive impact on anyone with a conference or a book, she is a part of it. I wouldn't trade her for anyone else in the world. As you read this, If you're not happy with your current job, family situation, or life, look first at what you can change in yourself before trying to alter your circumstances and recognize that not realizing what you want is a problem of knowledge. Not pursuing what you want is a problem of motivation. Not achieving what you want is a problem of persistence. If you know who you are, Make the changes you must in order to learn and grow, and then give everything you've got to your dreams. You can achieve anything your heart desires. Step number eight to failing forward. Change yourself, and your world changes. Chapter nine. Get over yourself. Everyone else has. One of the biggest changes that must be made by people who desire to fail forward is turning their attention away from themselves and toward helping others. You could call that process getting over yourself. A few years ago, I saw a wonderful movie called Mr. Holland's Opus that beautifully illustrated that whole process. The movie is the story of Glenn Holland, a young musician who desires to make it to the big time as a composer. But when money gets tight and he needs to take care of his family, he reluctantly seeks employment as a teacher. That job, which he takes only on a temporary basis, becomes his life. Through the course of the movie, he discovers that he wants to share his love for music with his students, and in the process, he discovers himself. The pivotal point of the movie comes when Mr. Holland's teaching position gets eliminated due to the cutbacks, and he suddenly realizes he has reached middle age. In that moment, he knows that he has forever missed his chance to pull up roots go to New York, and take his symphony with him, which he has been writing in his spare moments for the last 20 years. Despondent and feeling rejected, he believes he has wasted his life. He is depressed and on the verge of bitterness as he leaves his classroom. He ambles dejectedly down the hall, preparing to walk out of the school for the last time. That's when he hears something in the auditorium. When he checks to see what it is, He discovers dozens and dozens of students whose lives he changed during all his years of teaching. That group even includes the governor of the state, whose life took a major turn for the better under his mentoring. Many people believe that touching the lives of others can only be done by some elite group of specially gifted people. But that's not the case. Any ordinary person, just like Glenn Holland in the movie, can make a positive impact on the lives of others. 
Certain unsuccessful people tell themselves that as soon as they achieve considerable success or discover some unseen talent, they will turn their attention to making a difference in the lives of others. But I have news for them. Many people who struggle with chronic failure do so because they think of no one but themselves. They worry about what other people think of them. They scramble to make sure no one gets the better of them. They continually focus on protecting their turf. If you have a history of repeated failure and you dedicate most of your time and energy on looking out for number one, you may be someone who needs to learn a new way of thinking, where others come first. If you suspect that a selfish streak is preventing you from achieving your goals and dreams, you may need to change and improve your approach to success. First, you need to think about others rather than yourself. One of the greatest causes of negative thinking and poor mental health is self-absorption. Selfishness ultimately hurts not only the people around a self-focused person, but also the selfish person, him or herself. It inclines the person toward failure because it keeps him in a negative mental rut. That is the reason that Dr. Carl Manninger responded the way he did when someone asked, What would you advise a person to do if he felt a nervous breakdown coming on? Most people expected him to reply, consult a psychiatrist, since that was his profession. To their astonishment, manager replied, lock up your house, go across the railway tracks, find someone in need, and do something to help that person. My friend Kevin Meyer says, most people are too insecure to give anything away. I believe that's true. Most people who focus all their attention on themselves do so because they feel that they're missing something in their lives, so they're trying to get it back. Developing a giving spirit, as manager implies, helps a person to overcome some of those feelings of deficiency in a positive and healthy way. If you follow sports these days, you've heard a lot of talk about the selfishness of professional athletes. The recent criticism has been especially harsh toward pro basketball players because the feeling is that too many players possess a me-first mentality. The simple truth is that when competition is fierce, Selfishness will make it almost impossible for a team to win. It ultimately produces failure. If talent alone won championships, then the Los Angeles Lakers of the late 1990s would have earned one. Fortunately, all the stories out of the NBA aren't about selfishness and failure. If you look at the 1999 NBA champs, the San Antonio Spurs, you can see that their victory came because the man who had been their best player for a decade knew the importance of getting over himself. The person I'm referring to is David Robinson, the seven feet, one inch tall center for the Spurs. In his 10 years in the NBA, Robinson has earned just about every type of award that there is for a professional basketball player. He has also been named one of the 50 greatest players in the NBA history. Despite all of Robinson's personal achievements, the one thing he had never won was an NBA championship until the 1999 season. How did he do it? By giving up the ball offensively and allowing another player, Tim Duncan, to be the hero. During the 1999 playoffs, teammate Avery Johnson commented, What we have in David Robinson is the ultimate team player, the ultimate winner. He threw his ego out and became a totally different player for the good of the team. In 1999, Robinson put up the lowest averages of his career, but the result of Robinson's unselfishness was success for everyone on the team. If you want to win and overcome failure, you've got to get over yourself and begin helping others. How can you turn your focus from yourself and start adding value to others? You can do it by number one, putting others first in your thinking. When you meet people, is your first thought about what they'll think of you or how you can make them feel more comfortable? At work, do you try to make your coworkers or employees look good? Or are you more concerned about making sure that you receive your share of credit? When you interact with family members, whose best interest do you have in mind? Your answers show where your heart is. In order to add value to others, you need to start putting others ahead of yourself in your mind and heart. If you can do it there, you will be able to put them first in your actions. Number two, finding out what others need. 
How can anyone add value to others if he or she doesn't know what they care about? Listen to people, ask them what matters to them, and observe them. If you can discover how people spend their time and money, you'll know what they value. And when you know people's values, you can add value to them. Number three, meeting the needs of others with excellence and generosity. The final step requires concrete action. Once you know what matters to people, do your best to meet their needs with excellence and generosity. Offer your best with no thought toward what you might receive in return. When I think of some of the great figures in history who were able to minister to people's needs and perform great service, one of the first who comes to my mind is John Wesley, the 18th century Briton who founded the Methodist movement. He was a great leader and served God unselfishly his entire life. But there's someone else in his family whom I consider to have been more selfless than he, and in fact, made his achievements possible through her service. That person was John's mother, Susanna Wesley. At age 19, she married Samuel Wesley, a young clergyman who came to be regarded as one of the finest scholars of his day. They set up their household and they began their life together. Before long, Susanna bore them their first child, and then many more followed. Unfortunately, their hopes were greater than their prospects, and they spent nearly 50 years of marriage together, barely scraping by financially. In those days, middle-class women didn't work outside of the home. But Susanna had more than a full-time job nonetheless. She dedicated herself selflessly to caring for her family. She ran the household, managed the finances, and oversaw their modest farming efforts. And she did this while continuing to have numerous children. Over the course of 21 years, she gave birth to 19 children, and 10 of them survived. Despite all the work that Susanna Wesley performed for her family, the most important thing she did was educate her children. For six hours every day except Sunday, she dedicated herself to the moral and intellectual instruction of her three sons and seven daughters. She made it the object of her life. Her acts were incredibly selfless, and in the process she had given up a lot. But the results found in her children speak for themselves. Charles was an influential clergyman and has been called one of the greatest hymn writers of all time. And John is considered by many to have shaped England more than any other person of his generation. In our current times, you may not be able to give your family the kind of time Susanna Wesley did, but that's not important. What matters is that you give all you can to the people who are important to you. And you can only do that if you learn to get over yourself. Be more concerned with what you can give rather than what you can get, because giving truly is the highest level of living. Step number nine to failing forward. Get over yourself and start giving yourself. Chapter 10. Grasp the Positive Benefits of Negative Experiences Working artist David Bayless and Ted Orland tell a story about an art teacher who did an experiment with his grading system for two groups of students. It is a parable on the benefits of failure. Here's what happened. The ceramics teacher announced an opening day that he was dividing the class into two groups. All those on the left side of the studio, he said, would be graded solely on the quantity of work they produced. All those on the right side, solely on its quality. His procedure was simple. On the final day of class, he would bring his bathroom scales and weigh the work of the quantity group, 50 pounds of pots received an A, 40 pounds a B, and so on. And those being graded on quality, however, needed to produce only one pot, albeit a perfect one, to get an A. Grading time came, and a curious fact emerged. The works of the highest quality were all produced by the group being graded for quantity. It seems that while the quantity group was busily churning out piles of work and learning from their mistakes, the quality group had sat theorizing about perfection and in the end had little more to show for their efforts than the grandiose theories of a pile of dead clay. It doesn't matter whether your objectives are in the area of art, business, ministry, sports, or relationships. The only way you can get ahead is to fail early, fail often, and fail forward. I teach leadership to thousands of people each year at numerous conferences, and one of my greatest concerns is always 
that some people will go home from the event and nothing will change in their lives. They enjoy the show but fail to implement any of the ideas that were presented to them. I tell people continually, we overestimate the event and we underestimate the process. Every dream that anyone has achieved came because of dedication to a process. People naturally tend toward inertia. That's why self-improvement is always a struggle. But that's also the reason that adversity lies at the heart of every success. The process of achievement comes through repeated failures and the constant struggle to climb to a higher level. Adversity and the failure that often results from it should not only be expected in the process of succeeding, they need to be viewed as an absolutely critical part of it. In fact, the benefits of adversity are many. Listen to some of the key reasons you should embrace adversity and persevere through it. Number one, adversity creates resilience. Nothing in life breeds resilience like adversity and failure. A study in Time magazine in the mid-1980s described the incredible resilience of a group of people who had lost their jobs three times because of plant closings. Psychologists expected them to be discouraged, but they were surprisingly optimistic. Their adversity had actually created an advantage. Number two, adversity develops maturity. As the world continues to change at a faster and faster rate, maturity with flexibility becomes increasingly important. Those qualities come from weathering difficulties. Harvard Business School professor John Cotter says, I could imagine a group of executives 20 years ago discussing a candidate for a top job and saying, this guy had a big failure when he was 32. Everyone else would say, yep, that's a bad sign. I can imagine that same group considering a candidate today and saying, what worries me about this guy is that he's never failed. The problems we face and overcome prepare our hearts for future difficulties. Number three, adversity pushes the envelope of accepted performance. Lloyd Ogilvie says that a friend of his who was a circus performer in his youth described his experience learning to work on the trapeze. He said, Once you know that the net below will catch you, you stop worrying about falling. You actually learn to fall successfully. What that means is you can concentrate on catching the trapeze swinging towards you and not on falling because repeated falls in the past have convinced you that the net is strong and reliable when you fall. The result of falling and being caught by the net is a mysterious confidence and daring on the trampese. You fall less. Each fall makes you able to risk more. Number four, adversity provides greater opportunities. I believe that eliminating problems limits our potential. Just about every successful entrepreneur I've met has numerous stories of adversity and setbacks that open doors to greater opportunity. For example, in 1978, Bernie Marcus was fired from Handy Dan, a do-it-yourself hardware retailer. That prompted Marcus to team with Arthur Blank to start their own business. In 1979, they opened their first store in Atlanta, Georgia. It was called Home Depot. Today, Home Depot has over 760 stores employing more than 150,000 people and each year they do more than $30 billion in business. I'm sure that Bernie Marcus wasn't very happy about getting fired from his job back at Handy Dan. But if he hadn't been, who knows whether he would have achieved the success he has today. Number five, adversity prompts innovation. Early in the 20th century, a boy whose family had immigrated from Sweden to Illinois sent 25 cents to a publisher for a book on photography. What he received instead was a book on ventriloquism. What did he do? He adapted and learned ventriloquism. His name was Edgar Bergen, and for over 40 years he entertained audiences with the help of a wooden dummy named Charlie McCarthy. If you want to succeed, you have to learn to make adjustments to the way you do things and try again. Adversity helps to develop that ability. Number six, adversity brings unexpected benefits. The average person makes a mistake and automatically thinks that it's a failure. But some of the greatest stories of success can be found in the unexpected benefits of mistakes. For example, most people are familiar with the story of Edison in the phonograph. 
He discovered it while trying to invent something entirely different. But did you also know that Kellogg's cornflakes resulted when boiled wheat was left in a baking pan overnight? Or that ivory soap floats because a batch was left in the mixer too long and had a large volume of air whipped into it? Or that Scout towels were launched when a toilet paper machine put too many layers of tissues together? Number 7. Adversity Motivates Years ago, when Bear Bryant was coaching the University of Alabama's football team, the Crimson Tide was ahead by only six points in a game with less than two minutes remaining in the fourth quarter. Bryant sent his quarterback into the game with the instructions to play it safe and to run out the clock. In the huddle, the quarterback said, Coach says to play it safe, but that's what they're expecting. Let's give them a surprise. And with that, he called a pass play. When the quarterback dropped back and threw the pass, the defending cornerback, who was a champion sprinter, intercepted the ball and headed toward the end zone, expecting to score a touchdown. The quarterback, who was not known as a good runner, took off after the cornerback and ran him down from behind, tackling him on the five-yard line. It saved the game. After the clock ran out, the opposing coach approached Bear Bryant and asked, "'What's this business about your quarterback not being a runner?' Bear Bryant replied, well, your cornerback was running for six points. My quarterback, he was running for his life. Nothing can motivate a person like adversity. If you can step back from the negative circumstances you face in life, you will be able to discover that there are almost always positive benefits to your negative experiences. You simply have to be willing to look for them. Bill Vaughn says, in the game of life, it's a good idea to have a few early losses, which relieves you of the pressure of trying to maintain an undefeated season. Always measure an obstacle next to the size of the dream that you're pursuing. It's all in how you look at it. Try, and you can find the good in every bad experience. One of the most incredible stories of adversity overcome and success gained is that of Joseph of the ancient Hebrews. You may be familiar with the story. He was born the eleventh of twelve sons in a wealthy Middle Eastern family whose trade was raising livestock. As a teenager, Joseph alienated his brothers. First, he was his father's favorite, even though he was nearly the youngest. Second, he used to tell his father any time his brothers weren't doing their work properly with the sheep. And third, he made the mistake of telling his older brothers that one day he would be in charge of them. At first, a group of his brothers wanted to kill him, but the eldest Reuben prevented them from doing that. So when Reuben wasn't around, the others sold him into slavery. Joseph ended up in Egypt working in the house of a captain of the guard, a man named Potiphar. Before long, Joseph was running the entire household. He was making the best of a bad situation. But then things got worse. The wife of his master tried to persuade him to sleep with her. When he refused, she accused him of making advances to her and got Potiphar to throw Joseph in prison. But again, he made the best of a tough situation. Before long, the warden of the prison had put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners and all the prison's daily activities. While in prison, Joseph got a chance to meet a fellow prisoner who had been an official from Pharaoh's court, the chief cupbearer. And Joseph was able to do him a favor by interpreting a dream the man had. And when he saw that the official was grateful, Joseph made a request of him in return, that he would convince Pharaoh to let him out of prison. Joseph had great hope a few days later when the official was returned to court and the good graces of the monarch. He expected any minute to receive word that Pharaoh was setting him free. But two years passed before the cupbearer remembered Joseph, and he did so only because Pharaoh wanted someone to interpret one of his dreams. In the end, Joseph was able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, and because the Hebrews showed such great wisdom, the Egyptian ruler put Joseph in charge of the entire kingdom— when his brothers traveled to Egypt for relief from famine, twenty years after selling him into slavery, they discovered that their brother Joseph was not only alive, but second in command of the most powerful kingdom in the world. Few people would welcome the adversity of thirteen years in bondage as a slave and a prisoner. But as far as we know, Joseph never gave up hope and never lost his perspective, nor did he hold a grudge against his brothers. After their father died, he told them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. He found the positive benefits in his negative experiences. And if he can do it, so can we.
Step number 10 to failing forward. Find the benefit in every bad experience. Let's review now for a moment the first 10 steps to failing forward. Number one, realize there is only one major difference between average people and achieving people. Number two, learn a new definition of failure. Number three, remove the you from failure. Number four, take action and reduce your fear. Number five, change your response to failure by accepting responsibility. Number six, don't let the failure from outside get inside of you. Number seven, say goodbye to yesterday. Number eight, change yourself and your world changes. Number nine, get over yourself and start giving yourself. And step number ten to failing forward, find the benefit in every bad experience. Take a moment before you go on in the book and look at those ten steps to failing forward. Ask yourself or maybe somebody that's with you, how well do I do on these ten steps? Some, I'm sure, that you are already successfully failing forward. Others, maybe instead of going forward, you're failing backward. Take a moment. Evaluate yourself. Work on the weak areas. Evaluate these ten steps so that you can confidently fail forward. Chapter 11. Take a Risk. There's no other way to fail forward. Every era has its great explorers, people willing to face danger to break new ground and discover new worlds. The fuel that makes it possible for those people to conquer new territory is risk. As pioneer aviator Charles Lindbergh emphasized when he said, What kind of man would live where there is no daring? I don't believe in taking foolish chances, but nothing can be accomplished if we don't take any chances at all. Risk is a funny thing. It's very subjective. Someone may have no trouble plunging off a high tower with a bungee cord attached to his leg, but that same person may look at speaking in front of a group of 20 people as a death-defying risk. To another person, speaking isn't intimidating at all. For example, I love to speak to groups. I've spoken to groups as large as 82,000 people, and it's wonderful. On the other hand, you couldn't get me to bungee jump. So how do you judge whether some activity is worth the risk? Do you base it on your fear? No, you should do some things that scare you. Should you base it on the probability of success? No, I don't think that's the answer either. Risk must be evaluated not by the fear it generates in you or the probability of your success, but by the value of the goal. Allow me to tell you the story of someone who pushed the envelope of risk in order to achieve goals that had great value to her. Her name was Amelia Earhart. She grew up in the Midwest and had a very ordinary childhood. While in her early 20s, she took her first plane ride at Doherty Field in Long Beach, California. She was hooked. She said, As soon as we left the ground, I knew I myself had to fly. She immediately began working odd jobs to earn the $1,000 that would be required to take flying lessons, and it wasn't long before she was learning how to fly from Anita Snook, another pioneer flyer. Her heart found that learning to fly wasn't easy, or at least not for her, and she had more than her share of crashes, but she persevered. In 1921, Earhart made her first solo. The next year, she set the first of her many aviation records. She piloted planes because she loved to fly, but she also had an agenda. She was trying to break ground for others. She said, my ambition is to have this wonderful gift produce practical results for the future of commercial flying and for the women who may want to fly tomorrow's planes. By 1935, Amelia Earhart was a seasoned world-class pilot and had done a lot of things to accomplish her goals of opening doors for women and legitimizing commercial aviation. She must have believed the motto of all great achievers, if at first you do succeed, try something harder because that's when she decided to embark on her greatest adventure. She intended to fly around the world. Her first leg took her from Oakland to Hawaii, but as she took off from Luke Field near Pearl Harbor, she blew a tire and crashed the plane, causing tremendous damage. She had failed, but she wasn't ready to give up. Her plane was shipped to California for repairs, and she planned out her next attempt. Two years later, in June of 1937, she again started on her around-the-world voyage, 
this time heading east. For a month, she and her navigator, Frederick Noonan, made their way. and the end of June they had flown 22,000 miles. When they took off from New Guinea on July the 2nd, they had great hope because there were only 7,000 miles to go. But they were never seen again. If anyone had been able to talk to Earhart about her last hours, I believe she would have not expressed any regret for attempting what she did. To achieve any worthy goal, you must take risk. Amelia Earhart believed that and her advice when it came to risk was simple and direct. Decide whether or not the goal is worth the risk involved. If it is, stop worrying. The reality is that everything in life is risky. If you want to avoid all risk, then, well, don't ride in an automobile. They cause 20% of all fatal accidents. Don't travel by air, rail, or water. 16% of all accidents result from these activities. Don't walk in the street. 15% of all accidents occur there. And, well, I guess you shouldn't stay at home. 17% of all the accidents happen there. You see, in life there are really no safe places or risk-free activities. Helen Keller, author, speaker, and advocate for the disabled, asserted, Security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Everything in life brings risk. It's true that you risk failure if you try something bold because you might miss it. But you're also risking failure if you stand still and don't try anything new. As G.K. Chesterton said, I do not believe in a fate that falls on men however they act. But I do believe in a fate that falls on them unless they act. The less you venture out, the greater your risk of failure. Ironically, the more you risk failure and actually fail, the greater your chances of success. If risk has such great potential rewards, then why aren't people embracing it as a friend? I believe they don't because they tend to fall into one or more of the following six traps. Number one, the embarrassment trap. Deep down, nobody wants to look bad. And if you take a risk and fall flat on your face, you might embarrass yourself. But the only way to become better is to take steps forward, even shaky ones that cause you to fall down. Little progress is better than no progress at all. Success comes in taking many small steps. Number two, the rationalization trap. People who get caught in the rationalization trap second-guess everything they do, and as they prepare to take action, they tell themselves it's really not that important. But the truth is, if you wait long enough, nothing is important. Sidney J. Harris says, Regret for the things we did can be tempered by time. It is regret for the things we did not do that is inconsolable. Number three, the unrealistic expectation trap. For some reason, Many people think everything in life should be easy, and when they find out that achievement takes effort, they give up. But success takes hard work. There's a Latin proverb that says, If there is no wind, row. As you prepare to take a risk, don't expect to get a favorable wind. Begin with a mindset that you have to row. Then, if you get some help, it will be a pleasant surprise. Number four, the fairness trap. Psychologist M. Scott Peck begins his book, The Road Less Traveled, with the words, Life's not fair. That's a fact. But many people never learn it. Instead of acknowledging it and moving on, they expend their energy trying to find fairness. They say to themselves, I shouldn't have to be the one to do this. Number five, the timing trap. Some people tend to think that there's a perfect time to do everything, and this isn't it. So they wait. But Jim Stovall advises, don't wait for all the lights to be green before you leave the house. If you wait for the perfect timing, you'll wait forever. Number six, the inspiration trap. Someone once said, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. Many people want to wait for inspiration before they are willing to step out and take a risk. I find that especially true of people with an artistic bent. But as playwright Oscar Wilde says, when he was asked the difference between a professional writer and an amateur, the difference is that an amateur writes when he feels like it, a professional writes regardless. 
As you examine the way you live, consider whether you are taking enough risk, not senseless ones, but intelligent ones. Even if you don't fall into one of the six traps I just shared, you still may be playing it too safe. How can you tell? By looking at your mistakes. If you are succeeding in everything you do, then you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. And that means you're not taking enough risk. Step number 11 in failing forward. If at first you do succeed, try something harder. Chapter 12. Make Failure Your Best Friend The idea that you can make failure your best friend may seem very odd to you. But the truth of the matter is that failure is either your friend or your enemy, and you are the one who chooses which. If you play a dirge every time you fail, then failure will remain your enemy. But if you determine to learn from your failures, then you actually benefit from them, and that makes failure your friend. If you repeatedly use your failures as springboards to success, then failure can become your best friend. And here's what I mean. How would you feel about an incident in your life that cost you your nose, half your right arm, and all the fingers on your left hand? I'm guessing that you wouldn't look at it as positive. But that's what happened to Dr. Beck Weathers, and he sees that loss as the defining event in his life, the event that turned everything around for him. What event would cause a man to willingly embrace such a drastic disability? The answer can be found on Mount Everest. You see, Beck Weathers was one of the people on that peak during the now famous incident in 1996 when a blizzard suddenly came in and cost 12 people their lives. Weathers was 49 years old when he ascended Everest. At that point, he had been a mountain climber for 10 years, and it consumed him so much that it took much time away from his family. For the Everest climb, Weathers signed on with an expedition led by New Zealander Rob Hall. Before the team got to the high camp at 26,000 feet, Weathers was doing fine. But as he ascended the peak on May 10th, Weathers realized that he was in trouble. As he went up the mountain, the altitude caused the lenses in his eyes to flatten out, and that made him blind. At the time, it seemed that the best decision would be for Weathers to wait where he was, then rejoin the crew as they came back down from the summit, while disappointing it seemed to be the wisest choice. But it turned into a nightmare. A freak blizzard rapidly enveloped the mountain, dropping the temperature to about 50 degrees below zero and increasing winds to 70 miles per hour. Weathers got left behind on the mountain, and as hours passed, he lapsed into a hypothermic coma. Fellow climbers searched for Weathers for hours, and early in the morning on May 11th they actually found him. But he was covered with ice and barely breathing. They knew he would die, so they left him where he was and radioed to his wife that he was dead. No person has ever recovered out of a hypothermic coma and survived except Beck Weathers. Somehow he revived, got up, found his way, and staggered back into camp. His jacket was open. His face was black beyond recognition with frostbite, and his exposed right arm was marble white and frozen upright in front of him. Even after his miraculous return to camp, nobody thought Weathers would survive, but he kept pulling through. Back home in Dallas, he received medical attention. He underwent ten surgeries where they amputated the fingers on his left hand, amputated his right arm near the elbow, and reconstructed a new nose using tissue from other parts of his body. Through it all, Weathers went through a radical learning process. He believes he traded his hands for something more valuable, lessons about himself, his values, and life. Beck Weathers' attitude reflects more than just gratitude for surviving a great tragedy that should have killed him. He displays a teachability that has allowed him to change his life for the better. He has failed forward by making hardship his best friend. Fortunately, you don't have to be left for dead on top of the world's highest mountain to become teachable and learn how to make failure your friend. You can do it from the safety of your own home. All it requires is the right attitude. Your attitude toward failure determines your altitude after failure. Some people never understand that. As Louis Armstrong once quipped, there are some people that if they don't know, you can't tell them. Teachability is a mindset that says, no matter how much I know or think I know, I can learn from this situation. 
That kind of thinking can help you turn adversity into advantage. Anyone can make failure a friend by maintaining a teachable attitude and using a strategy for learning from failure. To turn losses into profits, I recommend that you ask the following questions every time you face adversity. Question number one, what caused the failure? The situation, someone else, or myself? Where did things break down? Were you in a no-win situation? Did another person create the problem? Did you make a mistake? When Beck Weathers looked at his Mount Everest experience after the fact, he determined that he had made mistakes which led to his failure. Always begin the learning process by trying to identify the cause of a problem. Question number two. Was what happened truly a failure or did I just fall short? What we think is our fault may have really been an attempt to fulfill unrealistic expectations. It doesn't matter whether we place them on ourselves or someone else does. If a goal is unrealistic and we miss it, that is not a failure. Question number three. What successes are contained in the failure? There's an old saying that states, The gym cannot be polished without friction, nor man perfected without trials. No matter what kind of failure you experience, there is always a potential jewel of success contained in it. Sometimes it may be difficult to find, but you can discover it if you are willing to look for it. Question number four. What can I learn from what happened? I enjoy reading the comic strip Peanuts by Charles Schultz. One of my favorites has Charlie Brown at the beach building a beautiful sandcastle. As he stands back to admire his work, it is suddenly consumed by a huge wave. Looking at the smooth sand mound that has been his creation a moment before, he says, There must be a lesson here, but I don't know what it is. That's the way many people approach adversity. They are so consumed by the events they experience that they become bewildered and miss the whole learning experience. But there is always a way to learn from failures and mistakes. Poet Lord Byron was right when he stated, Adversity is the first path to truth. Question number five. Am I grateful for the experience? One of the ways to maintain a teachable mindset is to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. And that's possible even in the face of great disappointment. For example, American sprinter Eddie Hart missed a preliminary heat for the 100-meter sprint in the 1972 Olympics in Munich. As a result, he lost his chance to win an individual gold medal. But he said it made him all the more grateful for the medal he received as a member of the relay team and for the lesson it taught him about living with defeats. As you come away from failure, try to cultivate a similar sense of gratitude. Question number six. How can I turn this into a success? Author William Marston says, If there is any single factor that makes for success in living, it is the ability to draw dividends from defeat. Every success I know has been reached because the person was able to analyze defeat and act... actually profit from it in the next undertaking. Determining what went wrong in a situation has value, but taking that analysis another step and figuring out how to use it to your benefit is the real difference maker when it comes to failing forward. Question number seven, who can help me with this issue? People say there are two kinds of learning, experience which is gained from your own mistakes and wisdom which is learned from the mistakes of others. I recommend that you learn from the mistakes of others as much as possible. After all, you will never live long enough to make them all yourself. Seek advice, but make sure it's from someone who has successfully handled his or her failures. Question number eight. 
Where do I go from here? Once all the thinking is done, you've got to figure out what to do next. In their book, Everyone's a Coach, Don Shula and Ken Blanchard state, Learning is defined as a change in behavior. You haven't learned a thing until you take action and use it. When you're able to learn from any bad experience and thereby turn it into a good experience, you make a major transition in life. For years, I've taught something that I think gives great insight on the subject of change. It says this, People change when they hurt enough that they have to, learn enough that they want to, and receive enough that they are able to. I learned the truth of that statement on a whole new level on December 18, 1998. While at my company's Christmas party, I felt an excruciating pain in my chest, and I suffered a serious heart attack. I honestly thought I wasn't going to make it that night. Although my heart attack was a painful and surprising experience, I feel that God was very good to me in that process. Several excellent physicians rallied around me and made it possible not only for me to survive, but to avoid any permanent heart damage. And I've learned a lot from it. For example, when it comes to telling the important people in your life how much you love them, you can never do it often enough. I believe my work on earth is not yet finished, and God has spared me so that I can complete it. I've learned that I must change my living habits for the sake of my health, the quality of my life, and the impact I desire to make in the future. My cardiologist, Dr. Marshall, told me that men who survive an early heart attack and learn from it live longer and healthier lives than those who never suffer a heart attack, and I have determined to learn from the experience. I've changed my diet, I'm also exercising every day, and I'm striving to live a more balanced life. But you don't need to suffer a heart attack or be caught in a blizzard on Mount Everest to make failure your best friend. In fact, I don't recommend it. All you have to do is maintain a teachable heart and be eager to learn every time you fail. Step number 12 in failing forward, learn from a bad experience and make it a good experience. Chapter 13, Avoid the Top 10 Reasons People Fail I don't put much stock in the idea of luck. I think that normally things go well or poorly for people based on their actions. I believe that for the most part you create your own luck by working hard, practicing self-discipline, remaining persistent, and making personal growth a daily priority. Add to that the blessings of a loving God and you don't need to think about luck. However, a few years ago, I came across an article printed in the Los Angeles Times that almost made me change my mind about luck. Listen to what it said. Jolted, jilted, hammered in a car crash and robbed, Lawrence Hanratty was named Friday as the unluckiest man in New York. Nearly electrocuted in a construction site accident in 1984 that put him in a coma for weeks, Hanratty lost the lawyers fighting for his disability claim. One was disbarred, two died, and his wife ran off with her lawyer. Hanratty, who was spent years fighting heart and liver disease, had his car wrecked in a crash last year. And when police left the scene of the accident, he was held up and robbed. As if he hasn't tolerated enough hardship, 38-year-old Hanratty of Mount Vernon, New York, said an insurance company now wants to cut off his workers' compensation benefits, and his landlord has threatened to kick him out of his apartment. Depressed and suffering from agoraphobia, a fear of open spaces, Hanratty uses a canister of oxygen and takes 42 pills a day for his heart and liver ailments. Hearing that story kind of makes you want to find poor Lawrence to see if you can help him out in some way, doesn't it? But I think the experiences of Lawrence Hanratty are not typical of most people who continually fail or experience continual ongoing adversity. Why? Because most of the time the trouble we face is the result of our own negative actions. It's usually our own fault. Many people possess blind spots when it comes to knowing about themselves. Sometimes those blind spots apply to strengths, but more often people fail to see their own weaknesses, and that causes trouble. If you don't know you have a problem, then you can't work to fix it. I'd like to acquaint you with what I have observed to be the top ten reasons people fail. As you listen, be open-minded and try to see yourself and your shortcomings in the descriptions that I give. Look for reoccurring issues in your life. As you do, 
you may find your Achilles heel. Number one, poor people skills. By far the greatest single obstacle to success that I see in others is a poor understanding of people. A while back, the Wall Street Journal printed an article on the top reasons that executives fail. At the top of the list was a person's inability to effectively relate to others. How are you when it comes to working with people? Are you genuine and authentic, or do you continually put up a front? Do you listen carefully to others, or do you spend most of your time doing the talking when you're with people? Do you expect everyone else to conform to your wishes, your schedule, and your agenda? Or do you look for ways to meet people on their terms? If you haven't learned how to get along with people, you will always be fighting a battle to succeed. However, if you can make people skills a strength, it will take you farther than any other skill you develop. Number two, a negative attitude. How you react to circumstances of your life has everything to do with your well-being and your success. Debbie Clement Stone tells a story about a young bride who traveled with her husband to the California desert during World War II. Because she had grown up in the East, the desert seemed remote and desolate to her. The only housing they could find was a shack near a village of Native Americans, none of whom spoke English. She spent a lot of time there alone, waiting out the sweltering heat each day. When her husband was gone for a long period, she wrote her mother to say that she was returning home. A few days later, she received a reply that said, Two men looked from prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. Those words helped the young woman to see things more clearly. She made friends with her Native American neighbors. She began working with them on weaving and pottery. And she took time to explore the desert and discover its natural beauty. All of a sudden, she was living in a new world, and the only thing that had changed was her attitude. If your circumstances constantly get you down, then maybe it's time for a change, not of your situation, but in your attitude. Number three, a bad fit. Though we should always first examine our attitudes when we don't enjoy our circumstances, Sometimes a change in situation also is in order. Sometimes a case of mismatched abilities, interests, personality, or values can be a major contributor to chronic failure. Few things in life are more frustrating than being stuck in a profession or organization that doesn't suit you. Evaluate yourself and your situation. If there is a poor fit, think about making a change. Number four, lack of focus. Bad things happen when a person doesn't focus. Anybody can make an honest mistake when things get hectic, but people lacking focus have trouble not because they're too busy, but because their priorities are out of whack, and that wastes their time and resources. If you find yourself going from task to task to task without making any progress, or you can't seem to reach a goal no matter how much effort you give it, examine your focus. No one can move forward without it. Number five, weak commitment. For a long time, it seemed that apathy was chic, but effort and commitment seemed to be coming back into style. And that's a good thing, because without commitment, you cannot accomplish anything of value. The last time you failed, did you stop trying because you failed, or did you fail because you stopped trying? What was your level of commitment? If you're committed, then when you fail, it doesn't mean that you'll never succeed. It just means that it will take you longer. Commitment makes you capable of failing forward until you reach your goals. Number six, unwillingness to change. Perhaps the greatest enemy to achievement, personal growth, and success is inflexibility. Some people seem to be so in love with the past that they can't deal with the present. You don't have to love change in order to be successful, but you do need to be willing to accept it. Change is the great catalyst for personal growth. It gets you out of a rut, it gives you a fresh start, and it affords you an opportunity to reevaluate your direction. If you resist change, you're really resisting success. Learn flexibility or learn to like living with your failures. Number seven, a shortcut mindset. 
One of the most common obstacles to success is the desire to cut corners and take the short road to success. But shortcuts never pay off in the long run. As Napoleon said, victory belongs to the most persevering. Most people tend to underestimate the time it takes to achieve something of value, but to be successful, you have to be willing to pay your dues. James Watt spent 20 years laboring to perfect his steam engine. William Harvey labored night and day for eight years to prove how blood circulated in the human body, and it took another 25 years for the medical profession to acknowledge that he was right. Cutting corners is really a sign of impatience and poor self-discipline. If you are willing to follow through, you can achieve a breakthrough. That's why Albert Gray says, The common denominator of success lies in forming the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Number 8. Relying on talent alone. Talent is overrated, not because it doesn't have value, but because talent alone isn't enough to take a person through the multiple failures that life brings. Adding a strong work ethic to talent is like pouring gasoline on a fire. It's explosive. But the greater your talent, the more likely you are to lean heavily on it and skip the hard day-to-day -day work of improving it. If you possess this negative tendency, put yourself on a growth plan so that you can make the most of whatever God-given talent you have. Number 9. Acting on Poor Information One of the things that successful executives have in common is the ability to make weighty decisions based on limited amounts of information. But they also have in common the ability to gather reliable information to use as they evaluate things. General Douglas MacArthur knew this. He asserted, expect only 5% of an intelligence report to be accurate. The trick of a good commander is to isolate the 5%. Number 10. Not having any goals. Don Marquis says, ours is a world where people don't know what they want and are willing to go through hell to get it. Many people don't have goals because they haven't allowed themselves to dream. As a result, they don't possess a desire. If that describes you, then you've got to look deep within yourself and try to determine why you're on this planet. Once you've discovered that, you'll know what to shoot for. If you can discover the weakness that weakens you, then you can start doing something about it. And that can change your life. I've seen that happen over and over again in people who desire success. Let me tell you about one of them. One of the people I rely on most at the Enjoy Group is my good friend Dan Ryland. He and I have worked together for 16 years. He is highly organized, and he goes after a goal with a vengeance. But when I first met him, let's just say that because he was purpose-driven, he was not the most relational guy in the world. When Dan started working with me, he was an intern. I remember one day at the office, soon after he started working at the church, I was standing in the lobby having a conversation with a group of people, and Dan came in from a parking lot with his carefully arranged briefcase. He walked right through the group of us and didn't say a word. I excused myself from the group, and I followed him. Dan set his briefcase down on his desk, and when he turned around, he was surprised to see that I was standing there. I asked him why he had walked by the group of us without saying a word. He replied that he had lots of work to do. Then I looked him straight in the eye and said, You just passed your work. Over the next few years, Dan and I worked together on his relationships with people. Today, if you were to meet Dan, you would think that his ability to work with people is a natural strength because he is so good at it. And if I have a tricky assignment that requires someone with exceptional people skills to carry it out, do you know who my first choice is? Dan. And that has become possible because of his willingness to grow and change. He has taken a weakness and turned it into a strength. If you are dedicated to overcoming failure and achieving lasting success, then you need to be willing to do the same. Work on that weakness that weakens you, and there is no telling how far you will go. Step number 13 to failing forward, work on the weakness that weakens you. Chapter 14. The little difference between failure and success makes a big difference. Most unsuccessful people believe that a huge gaping chasm stands between them and success. They suspect deep down that they will never be able to cross that void and get to the other side in achieving their dreams. But I want to let you in on a little secret. 
there's not much difference between failure and success, and the little difference there is makes a big difference. What creates that difference? Let me share a story with you, and you will be able to guess what the difference maker is. I think everybody in the United States has heard of Macy's Department Store, thanks to their famous Thanksgiving Day Parade and the movie Miracle on 34th Street. But fewer people know about the man who founded the store in 1858. His name was R. H. Macy. The son of a sea captain, Macy was born in Nantucket at a time when whaling was keen. In his early years, he worked several odd jobs, including a four-year stint on a whaling ship and six months as a printer's apprentice. But his ambitions were higher. That's when he decided to try his hand at retail trade. With the money he saved from his time at sea, he opened a small thread and needle store in Boston. His hopes were high and his work ethic was strong, but the business failed within a year. For the next several years, Macy tried various endeavors, but all of them eventually ended in failure. For example, he opened two more retail stores in Boston, but failed to make a profit each time. He traveled to California in the gold rush, but failed to strike it rich. He sold supplies to the miners of the gold rush, but when the gold ran out, so did his business. Twice more, he opened up dry goods stores in Boston, but twice he struggled to keep up with the competition and eventually he declared bankruptcy. He worked as a stockbroker, but only achieved minimal success in the difficult economy. He tried real estate, but again had little success. Finally, following a real estate investment disaster, a friend convinced Macy to return to the retail trade. This time he decided to try his luck in Manhattan, and that was to make a tremendous difference. In 1858, R.H. Macy opened a fancy dry goods store. After only 12 months, he was grossing $80,000 a year. By the 1870s, the store averaged over $1 million in sales per year. In 1877, Macy died while on a buying trip in Europe. However, his business lived on, and it continued to bring innovation to retail trade. Today, the company continues to serve customers with 191 Macy stores. Those stores exist because of one man who simply refused to give up. As you have no doubt guessed, the quality that took Macy through failure after failure after failure was his persistence. That is the little difference that makes a big difference when it comes to failing forward. It separates those who achieve success from those who only dream about it. Nothing worth achieving comes easily. The only way to fail forward and achieve your dreams is to cultivate tenacity and persistence. But to begin cultivating those qualities, you need a strategy. And that's what I want to share with you now, a four-point plan for approaching achievement that will encourage stamina and resilience in the face of failures. Number one, find a purpose. More than anything else, what keeps a person going in the midst of adversity is having a sense of purpose. It is the fuel that powers persistence. If you are a purpose-driven person naturally, then you probably already possess an innate sense of direction that helps you to overcome adversity. But if you're not, then you need some help. Use the following simple steps to help you develop a desire. Letter A. Get next to people who possess great desire. B. Develop discontent with the status quo. C. Search for a goal that excites you. Letter D. Put your most vital possessions into that goal. And finally, letter E. Visualize yourself enjoying the rewards of that goal. Number two, eliminate excuses. Agricultural scientist George Washington Carver noted, 99% of failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses. Having desire alone will not get you through your failures. You have to forget about making excuses and keep moving forward as R.H. Macy did. No matter how many opportunities you've missed or mistakes you've made, don't ever make excuses. Bite the bullet. Take complete responsibility for yourself and keep trying. Number three, develop incentives. Nothing helps a person remain tenacious like a good incentive. That's why so many companies use them with their employees. Walter Elliott said, Perseverance is not a long race. It is many short races one after another. 
If you give yourself worthwhile incentives to win the short races, attaining a long-term goal seems less formidable. Number four, cultivate determination. Author Napoleon Hill noted, effort only fully releases its reward after a person refuses to quit. To develop persistence over the long haul, you have to cultivate inward determination on a continual basis. And if you do, someday your story may be similar to Admiral Perry, who attempted to reach the North Pole seven times before he made it on try number eight, or Oscar Hammerstein, who had five flop shows that lasted less than a total of six weeks before Oklahoma, which ran for 269 weeks and grossed seven million dollars. Or John Creasy, who received 743 rejection slips from the publishers before one word was ever published. He eventually published 560 books, which have sold over 60 million copies. Or Eddie Arcaro, who lost 250 consecutive races before he won his first. Learn to become a determined individual. Inspire yourself with stories of people who tried, failed, and kept going. And remember, the only difference between a little shot and a big shot is that the big shot kept on shooting. When it comes to persistence, one of the most remarkable people I've ever known is Orville Rettenbacher, the popcorn king. Rettenbacher was born on a farm in Jackson Township, a few miles south of Brazil, Indiana, in 1907. At age 12, he started growing popcorn in addition to his numerous chores. In time, his additional crop brought in $150 a month, most of which was set aside for his college. In 1924, he graduated from high school, the first person in his family to do so. He received an appointment to West Point, but instead he went to Purdue. His ambition was to become a county agent. Times were tough, and coming from a farming family meant that he didn't have much money. So Redenbacher worked hard and did lots of odd jobs for the university in the agricultural department, including some experiments with popcorn hybrids. In 1928, he received his degree in agriculture. After graduation, the first job he took was that of a teacher. Then a year later, he changed professions and became a county agent, a job he held until 1940, all the while continuing his experiments with popcorn hybrids. For the next 10 years, Redenbacher managed 12,000 acres of farms for the Princeton Mining Company and continued his experiments. Then in 1950, he and a friend decided to go into business together, and they purchased a seed company. That freed up more time for Redenbacher to develop his hybrid, but it was a huge undertaking. To give you an idea of the magnitude of the task, listen to the words of his grandson, Gary Redenbacher. Grandpa was a tireless worker. Those who have ever tried to hybridize a rose or any other plant know that it's just a matter of dogged determination and time. I tell people to imagine that they are in a football stadium full of fans. Imagine that each fan is a stalk of corn. Your job is to go to each corn stalk in the stands and individually pollinate each one. But since the average football stadium only holds 50,000 people, you'll need to do three stadiums before you've pollinated as many corn stalks as Grandpa did each year. Through all the tens of thousands of hybrids, Grandpa never lost sight of his goal, to produce a better popcorn. Finally, in 1965, Redenbacher perfected his popcorn hybrid. He had a popcorn that outperformed every other variety in popping volume, popability, and flavor but it took him another 10 years to make his popcorn the best-selling brand in the world. It would have been easy for Redenbacher to quit his quest for the perfect popcorn many times. He wasn't successful, marketing it until he was 67 years old. But he had a dream and the determination to pursue it, and he wouldn't give up. When asked about his philosophy, he said, I followed the classic homespun principles, never say die, Never be satisfied, be stubborn, be persistent. Integrity is a must. Anything worth having is worth striving for with all your might. If you desire to succeed, realize that there is not much difference between success and failure. If you are willing to be doggedly persistent, you can be a success. Step number 14 in failing forward. Understand there is not much difference between failure and success. Chapter 15. It's what you do after you get back up 
that counts. Although persistence is important, it isn't the only key to success. I think you need persistence plus something more. It's just like the old saying about boxers, that a champion gets up one more time than he gets knocked down. While that may be true, if that's the only thing he does, he may finally win, but not before getting his brains beat out. Who wants that? He's much better off if he needs to get up off of the mat only a few times. He does that by figuring out how to knock out his opponent. That's what Milton Bradley did, in a manner of speaking. He figured out what to do so that he wouldn't continue falling down. He started out his career at age 20 as a draftsman. That was in 1856. By 1860, he had earned enough money to buy a printing press and go into business for himself as a lithographer. His first great product idea was to lithograph the newly elected President Abraham Lincoln. As soon as he offered the print for sale, the order started flooding in. And he would have kept making money except for one problem. His print was of a clean-shaven Lincoln, but the new president had grown a beard. It nearly ruined Bradley. While he was trying to cope with his first major setback, he decided to try selling something different, a game. He had a concept for a game he called the Checkered Game of Life, which taught moral values. He designed the game himself and printed up copies, and the game sold well. In fact, that first year he sold 40,000 copies. That first success gave him a new direction in life. He turned his attention to producing games and other materials that instructed people while entertaining them. Primarily, that meant games. But it wasn't long before he wanted to expand more intentionally into educational resources. A new concept to America had come across the Atlantic Ocean from Germany called kindergarten, and Bradley became very excited by it. Bradley saw the great educational potential of kindergarten for children and the potential market for materials to teach them. In time, Bradley became one of kindergarten's chief proponents. He produced numerous materials and even published the influential journal Kindergarten Review. He made a difference in the lives of thousands upon thousands of children. Maybe you're someone who has developed the persistence and resilience to keep getting up when you get knocked down. But you're getting weary of dragging yourself back onto your feet again and again without making any progress. You may be physically and emotionally exhausted. If so, it's because you need to do more than just get back up. What you need is a plan that will help you determine what to do after you've gotten back up. Try using these seven simple steps based on the acronym FORWARD. The letter F stands for FINALIZE YOUR GOAL. In the last chapter, I wrote about the importance of having purpose in developing a desire. The next step is to settle on a definite goal you may want to reach. The boxer in the ring who gets back up has as his goal knocking out his opponent. Milton Bradley had his, to produce educational products for kindergarten students. You need to determine what your goal is. Recognize that the goal shapes the plan, the plan shapes the action. The action achieves the results, the results bring success. The letter O stands for Order Your Plans. The saying is old, but it's true. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. There is no guarantee that what you plan will be carried out in the way that you envision it. But if you neglect to plan, your chances of success are very slim. The letter R stands for Risk Failing by Taking Action. Planning alone won't bring success. The other half of the battle is taking action. Conrad Hilton said, Success seems to be connected with action. Successful people keep moving. Moving forward on a plan and actually doing it always involves risk. And that's good, because nothing of value is achieved without risk. The letter W stands for Welcome Mistakes. By now you realize that mistakes are not to be avoided, but embraced. They are signals that you're moving into new territory, breaking new ground, making progress. As the old English proverb states, He who makes no mistakes never makes anything. The letter A stands for Advance Based on Your Character. Every time you face mistakes and attempt to move forward in spite of them is a test of character. 
That's because there always comes a time when giving up is easier than standing up, when giving in looks more attractive than digging in. And in those moments, character may be the only thing you have to draw on to keep you going. After you've been knocked down, and you've had the will to get back up, the intelligence to plan your comeback, and the courage to take action, know that you will experience a defining moment. And it will define you, as an achiever or as someone who quit. The letter R stands for Reevaluate Your Progress Continually. The value of fighting through the difficult times and overcoming mistakes is that you have the opportunity to learn and adjust. Katie Payne, CEO of the Delahaye Group, says, Business culture teaches us never to admit our mistakes, but to bury them instead, or to blame somebody else. And most personal and project reviews don't really do much to uncover mistakes. If we wait until we've finished a project to conduct a post-mortem, people will forget the mistake, or they'll build up a grudge against the co-worker. Either way, we lose a learning opportunity. The letter D stands for Develop New Strategies to Succeed. Lester Thurlow said, A competitive world has two possibilities for you. You can lose, or if you want to win, you can change. Once you develop a plan and put it into action, you're not done. In fact, if you want to succeed, you're never done. Success is in the journey, the continual process. And no matter how hard you work, you will not create the perfect plan nor execute it without error. You will never get to the point where you no longer make mistakes. But that's okay. Failures are milestones on the success journey. Each time you plan, risk, fail, reevaluate, and adjust, it gives you another opportunity to begin again, only better than the last time. As 67-year-old Thomas Edison said after he watched his laboratory burn to the ground, Thank goodness all our mistakes were burned up. Now we can start again fresh. Starting over usually isn't easy to say the least, but it sure can bring incredible results. I was reminded of that on a trip I took to Asia in the fall of 1999. My favorite stop on that trip was in Singapore. It's incredible. It's the most modern country in the world. Our tour guide, Susanna Fu, told us that Singapore was part of the British Empire for more than a century. After World War II, as the British granted independence to more and more members of their former empire, the people of Singapore began to think about their own independence, but the British were skeptical. Singapore had no natural resources and no experience in government. In 1959, when Singapore was granted its independence, the country didn't do well. That's when they decided that their best hope was to attach themselves to Malaysia, which they did in 1963. But the Malaysians didn't get along well with the people of Singapore, and after two years, Malaysia severed ties with them. The country's leader, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, felt that the country had been cast adrift with few prospects and little hope. There was only one thing to do, work themselves out of the horrible situation that they were in. Yu wrestled with the problems until he had a plan. Number one, bring in industry. His first objective was to bring in industries that would employ many low-skilled workers so that the people would have jobs. Two, create public housing. He wanted the people's quality of living to improve and to inspire them. They would move into better housing, but they would pay for it themselves. Number three, send people to school. The only way for the country to improve was for the people to improve themselves. He would make education affordable for everyone. Number four, set up a banking system. The goal was nothing short of making Singapore the financial center of Asia. Number five, encourage international travel. Singapore would become a business and tourist destination with a world-class airport. Prime Minister Yu's goal was lofty and his plan was ambitious, but the people of Singapore persevered. First, they received hundreds of millions of dollars in loans from the World Bank and the countries of England and Japan. Next, they started bringing in experts from around the world to help them, carefully selecting representatives from countries who led their fields. From Japan and Germany, technical advisors to set up factories. From Sweden and Holland, experts on banking and financing. From Israel, army advisors. From New Zealand and Australia, air force and naval advisors. Then they brought in 1,200 companies from the United States and Japan, including 
General Electric, IBM, Hewlett Packard, Philips, Sony, Mitsubishi, Caterpillar, Texas Instruments, Mobile Oil, and others. As our guide Susanna Fu told us the story, she fought back the tears. She had been one of the struggling, uneducated people that the country had helped to make a better life. As a teenager in the 1960s, she had dropped out of high school. But as the country got on track, so did she. She went back to night school and improved herself. Today, now in her 50s, she understands the incredible distance she and her country have traveled. She has seen Singapore City go from a land of swamp and scrub to a great international city. And she has seen the people go from ignorant and helpless to a rugged, disciplined group of achievers. I'm not sure when I will get back to Singapore, but as I left, I realized that I would not forget Susanna Fu or her beautiful city. In all the countries and cities I've ever been, no place better exemplified what it means to fail forward. Step number 15 in failing forward, get up, get over it, and get going. Chapter 16. Now you're ready to fail forward. Well, now you know what it takes to fail forward. I believe wholeheartedly in what I've shared with you. Let's review all 15 steps to failing forward. Number one, realize there's one major difference between average people and achieving people. Number two, learn a new definition of failure. Number three, remove the you from failure. Number four, Take action and reduce your fear. Number five, change your response to failure by accepting responsibility. Number six, don't let failure from outside get inside of you. Number seven, say goodbye to yesterday. Number eight, change yourself and your world changes. Number nine, get over yourself and start giving yourself. Number ten, Find the benefit in every bad experience. Number 11. If at first you do succeed, try something harder. Number 12. Learn from a bad experience and make it a good experience. Number 13. Work on the weakness that weakens you. Number 14. Understand there's not much difference between failure and success. And number 15. Get up, get over it, and get going. Those are the steps. But I have to say that they may not really hit home with you until you see them in the life of somebody you consider to be a lot like you. Let me tell you about a friend of mine named Dave Anderson. Dave is an entrepreneur that I met at a leadership conference that I recently taught in Kenosha, Wisconsin. When you hear a little bit about him, you may think that everything he touches turns to gold. Dave's net value, $30 million. Education, master's degree from Harvard University. His current position, the chairman of Famous Daves of America, a company with 3,000-plus employees and annual sales of $41.6 million. Some career highlights, he founded Famous Daves of America and took the company public. He co-founded the Rainforest Cafe and took it public. He was named Emerging Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young. He was the director and executive vice president of an organization judged the fastest-growing company in America by Fortune magazine. He has helped create over 18,000 jobs so far in his career through his vision, leadership, and ability to see opportunity. That's an impressive profile, but to really understand and appreciate Dave's achievements, you need to know more about his failures. You see, Dave has lived out every one of the steps to failing forward, and I want to finish this tape with his story. And along the way, I'll tell you how the steps to failing forward fit into his life. David's first experience with a major failure came in college. During the break, after his first term, a friend from home recruited him to begin selling oil conditioner for automotive engines. Dave caught the vision, and with his father's $2,500 investment, he went right to work. But despite his tireless efforts, he couldn't sell a thing. Yet contained within that first big failure were seeds of his future success. Remember step number 15? Get up, get over it, and get going. First, Dave believed that he could be successful. Now, that's step number six. Don't let failure from outside get inside of you. Second, when his dad bought his product for him, Dave received a five-day leadership course 
that he says changed his life. Remember step number 10? Find the benefit in every bad experience. Every night for months, Dave went to sleep listening to those tapes. Step number 8. Change yourself and your world changes. The dream within him wasn't dead, and he wasn't going to let failure get him down. Step number 1. Realize there is one major difference between average people and achieving people. It was in 1972 that Dave got the idea for another business. Though the oil additive opportunity didn't work for him, it encouraged him to start thinking like an entrepreneur. Step number two, learn a new definition of failure. His idea was to create and sell miniature dish gardens. He scraped together a few dollars and bought the materials to make up a few samples. Then he went out and talked to retailers trying to get them to buy them. For the next seven years, he operated out of his basement and worked like a madman. He put in long hours, seven days a week. When his retail florist customers experienced their heavy crunch times, such as around Mother's Day and Valentine's Day, he would go into their shops, sweep up, clean out coolers, and do other chores for them to help them out. By age 21, he had accounts with every major retail florist in the city of Chicago. But there were more hard times to come. If you're from the Midwest, you probably remember the winter of 1979. It was one of the worst on record. The snowstorm that hit Chicago was horrible, and the drifts were so high that many side streets were closed for months. A lot of businesses went under that year, including Dave's. Florists didn't buy much in the middle of the blizzard. Many of Dave's customers not only weren't buying from him, but weren't paying him for the money they owed for orders that they had already received and he had to file for bankruptcy. After Dave lost his business, he knew he needed to find work to support himself. Remember step number five? Change your response to failure by accepting responsibility. He landed a job working for the American Can Company, selling Dixie Cups, Marathon paper towels, and tissue to restaurants. To get his foot in the door, he took their worst territory. Step number four, take action and reduce your fear. He put to work the same principles and tenacity that he had in the wholesale floral industry. Step number 14. Understand there's not much difference between failure and success. He made a lot of mistakes, experienced much rejection, and lost many sales. But he worked like crazy and kept learning. Step number 13. Work on the weakness that weakens you. In six months, he took a territory that had been in last place and made it number one in the company. He regained momentum. Step number seven, say goodbye to yesterday. He also discovered that his past failure didn't brand him for life. Step number three, remove the you from failure. Dave Anderson is a Native American. In 1982, Dave's tribe came calling. Their organization was losing money and recognizing his business prowess. They asked him to be their CEO. Step number 11, if at first you do succeed, try something harder. He led the tribe's concerns for three years. During that time, gross revenue increased from $3.9 million to over $8 million. He also was honored by various state and local government and business organizations and asked to sit on numerous councils for areas such as tourism and minority business development. In time, Dave was helping so many people that he was granted a Bush Leadership Fellowship for a lifetime of outstanding achievement by the Bush Foundation in St. Paul, Minnesota. Although Dave had achieved success in a variety of businesses over a relatively short period of time, he had not yet done anything related to his true passion, food. In 1994, Dave helped co-found a highly successful restaurant company called the Rainforest Cafe, and it made him wealthy. Step number 11. If at first you do succeed, try something harder. He used some of the money he made to purchase a small resort in Hayward, Wisconsin. There, Dave built the kind of restaurant he'd always dreamed of having, one that made great barbecue. It was called Famous Dave's. Soon he opened a second Famous Dave's, then other restaurants. At this point, if you didn't know better, you'd think Dave was set. But Dave was on the verge of facing the lowest point of his life and his greatest obstacle, himself. In 1995, a group of friends and family came to him in what's commonly called an intervention. In other words, they confronted him about his drinking. When the people who loved him called him on the carpet, he was secretly pleased because he knew he needed to change. So he went into treatment for alcoholism. 
He's been sober ever since. Dave knew he needed to change, and in the years since he turned his life around, he has seen lots of change in himself. Now continual learning and growth are the hallmarks of his life. Step number 12. Learn from a bad experience and make it a good experience. As I share this with you, Dave owns 24 restaurants in five states, and the business is still growing. But as incredible as Dave's achievement has been, what's even more remarkable is his realization that his success does not exist for himself alone, but so that he can help others. Step number nine, get over yourself and start giving yourself. He's doing that through an endowment fund for disadvantaged minority children, which he founded. Dave Anderson has made more mistakes, suffered more adversity, overcome more problems, and experienced more failures than most people you will ever meet. But he's also achieved more, too. And as my friend Zig Ziglar says, Dave Anderson is just getting started. The next time you look at successful people and find yourself envying what they have achieved, recognize that they have probably gone through a lot of negative experiences that you cannot see on the surface. There's an old joke that says, Never ask what's in a hot dog while you're eating one. The idea is that if you did know what's in it, you'd never want to eat one again. A lot of failure goes into success. If you really want to achieve your dreams, I mean really achieve them, not just daydream or talk about them. You've got to get out there and fail. Fail early, fail often, but always fail forward. Turn your mistakes into stepping stones for success. And now that you know how to fail forward, you won't have to give up either. I wish you well. Keep dreaming. And my friend, keep failing forward. That concludes Failing Forward, Turning Mistakes into Stepping Stones for Success by John C. Maxwell. Look for the complete book and other books and audiobooks by John C. Maxwell, including The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership and Developing the Leader Within You in quality bookstores everywhere. This has been a presentation of Nelson Audio.